Yeah, good afternoon and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. Good afternoon. We're going to continue walking through page 687, draft 4. One, and we have just been reminded by our legislative council what page we're on. 72. 72. Ellen Chaikowski, Office of Legislative Council. And also today, I have provided you with three timelines. Awesome. They are posted on your website. They're all in one document. I can separate them if you'd like, but there's timelines. Great. Why are there three? Well, the first is the overall milestones of this bill in entirety so it not only addresses the board which does have a lot of tasks it includes a couple of the other reports back that will interact with the board's work so that's the first one the second one is on the process for how a regional plan is adopted and comparing it to how it is in the statute currently and then the third is all of the dates in the designated area update because they not maybe entirely line up. So in sorting through that section, I also included that so you could see them all lined up and determine if they line up or not. But on page 72, this is the section, this is section 33 of the bill, it is the section on the adoption of regional plans. When last we spoke, um, we were discussing how the adoption uh, there are going to be new steps for the adoption of the regional plan. Um, and so uh, dur during the last uh, markup session on page 72, you decided to strike the first section about a recommendation from the Real Revitalization Board. Um, and then it goes into the, the ERB has... Um, to issue their determination on the regional plan within 45 days after it has been submitted. Um, if they have to, if they have uh, a negative determination, they have to state in writing what that is and what the modifications are. And RPCs are allowed to reapply and get a new determination within 45 days. And so then on to page 73. Um, it restates again what the criteria that the board is looking at when they're reviewing the regional plan. So it's consistency with the planning goals of 4302. Consistency with the elements described in 4348, which is the elements of the regional plan section. Except that the requirements of 4352 related to enhanced energy planning shall be under the sole authority of the public service department and shall not be reviewed by the downtown development board. So this is revitalization board. Um, so this is one thing just to check in on the, there is a process for enhanced energy planning. Um, and that is an existing statute in 4352. And right now, review of the municipal, of the regional enhanced energy plans do go to the department. So it is leaving that authority with them. Um, and then the online 10, that actually should be the ERB. And then finally, compatibility with adjacent regional planning areas, as described in 4302. Um, so last week, also, you were discussing whether or not the purpose section for um, the regional planning commission, the regional plan should be included. And so 
you could add it to this list, I think, if you'd like it to be something they're um, specifically reviewing. Sorry, we, we say that again. I was looking to see if we had a plan or anything. Yes. So the last week you were discussing the purposes section of a regional plan, which is separate from 4348. And so if you want that to be a specific criteria they're reviewing for, you may want to add it to this list. Because we actually added it somewhere else, didn't we? Is that right? No. But you did have a lot. So it is being updated, as you will recall, in um, section 32 of this bill to add references to climate change and um, resiliency. And so, so far, it hasn't been specifically included as something that needs to be reviewed. Um, I think otherwise, you know, then it is it is aspirational because it's a purpose section. So it is something that the regional planning commissions as they do their work are supposed to look to. But the question is, do you want the ERB to then also be looking to that section to see if the regional planning, uh, regional plan lines up? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we go back to uh, line nine. Mm -hmm. Well, actually that section there, during the public service department shall not Shall and shall not be reviewed by the downtown development board. What's the reason for that? So oh. there's already an existing process for the enhanced energy plan to be reviewed by the department. Okay. And that is a it is a feature of the regional plan. So it is a segment of the regional plan. And so I think this was included to specify that the, the department will still have jurisdiction over reviewing that. It's not part of the overall review that the ERB is doing. Okay, so, but they could still, if they had questions about it, they could still talk about it. Is it being review and question? Is that the same? Um, I mean, I think they could look at it, but they're not supposed to base their decision on the enhanced energy aspect. Which that falls out of the public service. Yes. Thank you. Seems like the way this is written, you could just put a period after the public service department. Because it says, except that shall be under the sole authority of. It's pretty clear. Okay. okay. Do you want to add reference to the purpose section here? You don't have to, but you were talking about it last week. Go ahead. Does it not make talk, so we're talking about adding the purpose section for the municipal planning? No, section 32 of this bill, which we talked about on Friday, it would <clears throat> update to the purpose of regional plans, specifically regarding climate change. Um, and so if I just was pointing out that it's not specifically addressed as something that the ERB is reviewing for conformance with. And you don't have to include it because it is primarily aspirational of what they're supposed to be doing with the regional plan, but um, just offering it as an option. Yeah, no, we had a lot of conversation about that, which is why Ellen's um, let's. Yeah, we can try it on for the next. So next is uh, Representative Sedelia. Uh, page 73, 16. <clears throat> so I didn't get there yet. Oh, so sorry. There. Yep. Yeah, so um, on page 73, there's um, language here added regarding objections from interested parties and how they weigh in on the regional plan review. So on page 73, line 14, an interested party who has participated in the regional plan adoption process may object to the approval of the plan or approval of future land use maps 
by the ERB within 15 days of plan adoption by the Regional Planning Commission. Participation is defined as providing written or verbal comments for consideration at a public hearing held by the Regional Planning Commission. Objections shall be submitted using a form provided by the board. You want us to ask them now, or do you want to keep it to just... Sure, there is more language on the next page regarding this, but... Uh... Hey, clarification question. The sentence reads that an interested party who has participated in the regional plan adoption process may object to the approval of the plan or approval of the future land use maps by the Environmental Review Board within 15 days of plan adoption by the regional planning, but that was before submittal to the ERB. Yeah. And, and yet, the way the sentence reads, so, so they have to object to the adoption. There's, but then what happens if they, if they want to adopt, uh, object after the approval, approval of the ERB because the, that's, that doesn't make sense because the 15 days after adoption by the regional commissions would have passed by the time that ERB takes it up. So this is why I think the timeline is helpful. Um, also, maybe it should, you're right. Uh, sorry, so Ledge Council this year is really trying to address day, within days of, and we're actually moving towards following. So I think on line 16, it actually should read uh, within 15 days following plan adoption. Um, and then in theory, there will be time for them to appear before the ERB, before they have their hearing. So this is different than an appeal. This is an objection process that you're sitting, setting up. And so the Regional Planning Commission is going to go through this process and then they are, these people have to have um, provided comments and then they will bring objections to the ERB, which the ERB will have to consider. So I do think some clarity could put a little bit of additional clarity here because the, it doesn't say, it, it says that they have to be submitted to the ERB B. So I do think there's some, you could be a little more direct about, are they bringing their objections to the Regional Planning Commission? I mean, I think that's implied by them having made comments, right? And then they bring their objection, I guess, to the adoption of the plan to ERB. So it's the right, yeah, the, it's the right it's word the on line 15, approval, or is it Delivery to delivery of plants to you know. No, so so okay, so you can make a choice here. the The way that it's phrased so far in this section, I do think is consistent because the regional plan is adopted by the regional planning commission and then submitted to the ERB for approval. There's two steps there. <laughs> And in this, the way it's written, we're saying they're objecting to the local approval of it. Adoption of it, yes. Adoption. Participated in the adoption process may object to the approval of the plan. Or not. Oh, you mean we object? Yeah. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, that's before. That's... Okay. Right, and so there isn't... There isn't any further appeal described in here. And so there is addition, there's some additional language on the next page that may help, but there isn't a, there isn't here a further appeal past the ERB. Celia. Yeah, um, I apologize. I haven't been able to get to the uploaded files. It's the approval process, one of the, oh, the timelines that you said you had. Yes. Do you want to look at my 
I have a paper copy. Well, do you want to stop and like dig into that now or if it matters? Look at when don't we get copies at the first break? And okay, consider that. Let's. Um, I have a question about the 15 days. We took the testimony the other day, and I know that we have worked in statute to be consistent around business days and total. So we've moved, I believe, towards just total biz total days so that people just don't worry about whether it's a business day or not a business day. Um, and so I just want to confirm that and say that I should probably leave this just 15 days because it's consistent trying to do in statute to be clear if people understand they're not deciding whether Saturday is a business day or whatever. And so um, I appreciate that. That was also a flag that I had. And um, given that we're leaving it, the language about days the same, and I think the concern was about the amount of time, I guess I would propose um, <clears throat> maybe going to 21 days or 22 days uh, instead. Something I need to consider. Their thoughts on that? I'm fine considering that. I, but I do want to continue to place it in the context of the other appeals processes that we've been setting up trying to have consistency on. May or may not relate to this process, but I just want to be aware because I know that we went through this with all the a &R permits and da, da 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 What does appeals look like and what's a reasonable amount of time? A lot of, a lot of thought about that. Yeah, Madam Chair, if I might. Mm. Yeah, I, I, uh, I appreciate that perspective and really am looking to a uh, good discussion, really, the kind of comprehensive time and making sure that it all kind of fits together. For those of us who are not, you will get there. Um, and so I will say this uh, as we as we talk about the rest of the language on the next page. Um, the ERB also has to do a fifteen day notice before their hearing on the plan, and so I think it coincides with that. They have to raise their objection before the actual hearing on the plan. So um, you may just want to keep those two numbers tied together. All right, let's get to the next page. Huh. On page 74, as used in this section, interested person means any one of the following. A person owning title to or occupying property within the region. Any 20 persons by signed petition who own property or reside within the region. A peti the petition must designate one person to serve as the representative of the petitioners regarding all matters related to the appeal, the designated representative must have participated in the regional plan adoption process as described in this section. And then a party entitled to notice under subsection D of this section. Um, so there are our, there is already a list of people who by default get notice of a regional plan uh, adoption, which we talked about last week. Um, and so that language is on page 69 and 70, if you want to. Um, so that the other day, um, Representative Sevilla. Uh, Ellen, what's the difference between A and B? I mean, isn't A um, any person that lives in the region? And then B is any 20? People who live in the region? Yeah. Um, I think this language came from the planners. Um, so I don't remember if we've talked about this at all yet, but um, no, I think that's a, a fair point. You can make it just so. This is somewhat mirroring what exists right now for a municipal appeals. There is the distinction with the municipal appeals that it, um, there's a distinction between an abutter or someone who's directly impacted by a decision as opposed to 20 people who can live anywhere within the municipality. So yeah, you may want to be a little more specific in subdivision B. Yeah. 
Well, it depends on what, sorry, but it just seems more specific than A at this point, but. Um, okay, well then maybe specific's the wrong word. You may want to make a distinction. We talked about this on Friday. Uh, I don't think we talked about this language. I think we talked about it in a different section. The same structure. Yeah. Well, similar structure. Um, so, oh, because I think when you were talking about approval of designations as opposed to the whole plan, yeah. So there's a there's an appeal list for those who are appealing the designation of a tier one A area. Picking up on like Sibelius question with this, why would you bother getting 20 people of young one? Um, so there's something funny about this. Yeah. To the extent it's a holdover. It is probably a holdover from when the the person would have had to show a direct impact, like it's my guess. And then the 20 is more generalized. So you can, and because in some ways, when you talk about regional plans or adoption of plans, it's probably generalized. So I mean, I guess I'm wondering whether we need A. Does A make it to which direction we want to go? I guess another way to put it yeah. out. Which direction we want to go because there, there really isn't any reason to get 20 if one will do. So um, we probably want to either make A mean something more and somehow be supposed to show a specific impact or just go, go over the 20 persons. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if it's an either or, I would want to go with the. Yep. And that, that other thoughts on this? All right. <clears throat> Close striking A. And then would we do it again? It's the same on 57? It's a little different on the next item. You don't need A on here at all. Yes. Seven, yeah, and it's uh, different. But you, on line B, you wouldn't want to just say any 20 persons. You need to say anyone up to 20 persons or? Oh, 20. Not to, to, so it's not for so one person would be able to address no, that? Be 20 people. That, that's going to be 20. It does, yeah. Okay. Please. I'm loading. Um, thanks. I I mean I feel like what would make it somewhat corollary to um fifty seven, the appeals on um, fifty seven for designations would be if somebody from an adjoining region, if people from an adjoining region wanted to appeal their approval of the nearby regions plan. That's somewhat what we're saying here. Fifty seven is um, or an like the twenty persons have to be in an like either in the municipality or an adjoining municipality. So we give some way for people nearby. So to petition, it just seems like it is unnecessarily necessary to, I don't know. It's like we talked about, some are really close. Yes. And so that one is different in that it does include the adjoining and 20 people. So the higher threshold for adjoining versus owning in, title in. Um, and just seeing the list of people who are already included and interested um, Includes the abutting regional planning commission. <clears throat> That's on the appeals. Objections. Objections. I am. 
it wedding notification. Yeah, so the la the language on line nine there, someone entitled the notice under subdivision D. So yeah, notice goes to the each abutting regional planning commission in addition to other people on that list. Yeah, and the abutting regional planning commissions can object. Yes. So I just want to flag here uh, the issue around consistency and, uh, of the RPC's governance and all of those things, which I don't think our study language would see here at this point. Yes, too. So, you know, <clears throat> you're kind of aligned to the individuals at that RPC to implement consistency across the state, you know, so with the ab abutters, there's really no rhyme or reason to, I shouldn't say there's no rhyme or reason, but there's no requirement for consistency. So there is, there. Well, okay, I guess consistency in what? Sorry, so. Application, um, so I mean, I, I've seen some pretty big inconsistencies. Okay, I think I'll, the prior page does require consistency with the neighboring regional plans. So that's why I think they're given the ability here to object. I don't think that's what you were speaking about necessarily, but so that's one thing. This is all under the section of the environmental review board reviewing these plans and that. So that's who would determine it. Environmental Oops. review board. Consistency. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, by property, are we including outside property? Yes. All right, so on page 74, line 10, any objection under this section shall be limited to the question of whether the regional plan is consistent with the regional plan elements and future land use areas as described in 4348 of this title. The requirements of 4352 of this title re related to enhanced energy planning shall be under the sole authority of the Department of Public Service and shall not be reviewed by the Environmental Review Board. The Environmental Review Board shall hear any objections to the regional plan adoption concurrently with pl regional plan review under 4348H and 6027. Oh, what that is a reference to. Oh, that's their authority. Sorry, that's their authority to hear review. Um, the ERB decision of approval of a regional plan shall expressly evaluate any objections and state the reasons for their decisions in writing. If applicable, the decision to uphold an objection shall suggest modifications to the regional plan. So uh, under on three, I'm wondering about the the pullout here of the energy planning specifically, because I, I knew that there are other requirements of the regional plans, like with transportation and a whole host of other things. So, so we, d we already talked about this on the last page. The, the Public Service Department currently has authority to review specifically this element of a regional plan, the enhanced energy. Um, and so there's interest, at least in this proposal, to keep that specific element of a regional plan with the department. So my, my question, though, is why, <clears throat> I mean, there are other requirements, so I understand. But I don't, but so like currently no other elements that relate to other things have a, have a separate approval process in statute. Yeah, I guess I'm just asking kind of the broader question of why why does why do we have this one as opposed to others? You know, I've heard some transportation folks suggest that they would like. Um... So it's because this comes with some significant benefits, right? So the enhanced regional uh, the enhanced energy planning is directly tied to the town's ability to weigh in on Section 248 cases. 
Um, and so that comes with substantial deference if the enhanced regional, if the enhanced energy planning is approved. So I do think that is different. I don't, I off the top of my head can't think of any other elements with the exception of the designation process you're creating in this bill that have a uh, weight to them that the enhanced energy planning is. <clears throat> Range. From VNRC, we would like to weigh in. Hey, uh, yeah, Brian, Natural Resources Council. Just to, to further elaborate, a couple of years ago, the legislature passed something called enhanced energy planning, and it allowed them to, um, to define areas that were suitable or unsuitable for electric generation facilities, mostly renewable facilities in the municipality. Um, and it gives them um, uh, preferential treatment, I forget what the term is. Substantial deference. Substantial deference in the uh, siting process as individual projects go through the uh, uh, review process in those towns. So it's it's not, it's something that's voluntary. A town doesn't have to seek enhanced energy planning. And what the goal was to make sure that the town was accommodating the state's energy needs and energy goals while also providing them with the opportunity to have some citing standards in the community. So it's, it's really a very unique process. And I don't have a strong opinion about whether it should go through this process or not. I really haven't thought it, already, it already does go, oh, whether to go through the ERB. The ERB yeah. Right, right, yeah. Um, yeah, if I may chime in Gil. from the peanut gallery, Pete Gill, uh, Executive Director of the Natural Resources Board. I'll just mention too that the, um, energy compliance determinations are um, appealable to the Natural Resources Board. <clears throat> so, that in the next. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Someone's phone is ringing and maybe it could be silenced or something. <laughs> um, so, did you so, say that again? Yeah, so I'll just note that the energy uh, um, uh, plant, the uh, elements are already um, uh, going through the, they're appealed, appealable to the Natural Resources Board. Current, current natural resources board. So if someone seeks approval through the PUC, it's a, it's appealable to the natural resources board? Yeah, uh, is it PUC or? So it's a, it's a layered the process. FSC, right? It's the department. The right. department, it's the department. Yeah. Yeah. So the department yeah. and then, go, then it would be, then it would go, the appeal would go to the natural resources board. Uh, I'm not aware of any appeals that we've had since that was enacted uh, at least five years ago or more. Um, do other, is there any other appeals the Natural Resources Board has jurisdiction over right now that we should know about? Uh, any other weird quirks? Not that I'd not know. <laughs> that, that's a really weird one. Yeah, yeah, I think. Fee refunds. I think we've captured those. Yeah. I think they're in, they're denoted in here. Yeah, all right. I think we should carry on. Okay, so that's the end of the section on objections. Um, on Representative Tony. Just a, a quick refer, refer back to line three. <laughs> if you delete line A, a person owning title to or occupy. I'm just wondering if we deleted that, if a tenant business owner would then not, because the second, the 20 people are either owners of property or reside. So I did want to flag, um, I think, uh, so that's an interesting question because is tenancy a residence? Um, you may want to be more clear there. I was also going to point out that last year you amended the municipal statute to also say um, owns property, reside, or is a or a voter. Yeah, I was remembering that when we were talking about it. No longer linking it to or being a voter. Um, yeah, and is occupying is that a tenant or a renter, like a business renter or a residential renter? Well, so it's own or occupying. Owning title to or occupying. The one we're deleting. Yeah. Um, occupation is occupying. So I was going to suggest that we 
if you were to keep that to line it up with the same language that's used in Title 24, because it also doesn't match line four. So, um, yeah, if you, and I think that goes to Representative Tory's question of um, occupying, I think, is different than residing, which suggests more suggests commercial than the word reside. Right. Yeah, so a tenant business person, do we think a tenant business person should be able to appeal this? Regional planning map, so regional plans. <laughs> Any thoughts on this currently? Otherwise, we have to keep going. <laughs> you, Representative Stebbins. Generally, uh, I'll just say this to me seems pretty broad. Um, the A that we were yes. suggesting to strike. Yes. Yeah. Broad in a way that you think is overly broad and not you don't support. Overly broad. Um, I mean, hopefully, uh, the 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 process by which you know the iterative map making will. Uh, you know, we'll get to public process at some point, but it will be something that really connects to people and, and reflects what municipalities are envisioning for themselves, et cetera. So I don't know, for any one person owning anything or or just occupying anywhere in the region, it just, um, it feels like it could be, I think you would call it a frivolous appeal at one point, but it, it could be essentially a mechanism to stop something. Right. So hearing for now, we're holding with the leading A and moving on. Senator Levy. Thanks. Um, quick question, though, on B. Do we, uh, now that you've mentioned that occupying property um, does have that potential for a tenant business owner, um, would we want to add that term into B? Any 20 persons by sign petition who own property or reside or occupy property or something like that? Yeah. So I, guess I, I guess I lean against that. I'm in favor of the favor of looking at it last year because tenants deserve yeah. to have like one, but I'm, I'm at, I'm at apartment tenants. Oh, I, to have rights. Absolutely. And I feel a little less strongly about somebody in the business space. And this language that we have now is pretty broad because it's any 20 people who live in the region. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to gain your potential, your signatures. Your side within the region. Yeah. So it's, I guess I'm, I kind of, I guess I lean toward that. I don't, I don't feel strongly about it because somebody feels the opposite strongly. I would just, I think B is it's written looks. But somebody feels strong. <clears throat> and, uh, Region is the RPC region. So in this case, the 22 towns, 40,000 people that live in the Wyndham region, we would need 20 people to. It's a pretty low bar. Yeah. Yep, low bar. So on page 75, um, you have looked at this language before, uh, but this is minor amendments to the regional plan. Um, but I think we should probably read through it. So a regional planning commission and a municipality may submit a joint request for a minor amendment to boundaries of a future land use area pursuant to this chapter for consideration by the ERB. The joint request may only be submitted after an affirmative vote of the municipal legislative body and the regional planning commission board. The ERB after cons consultation with the community Re revitalization board and the Regional Planning Commission shall provide guidance about what constitute 
constitute a minor amendment. Minor amendments may include any change to a future land use district consisting of less than 10 acres. A minor amendment to a designated area plan shall not require an amendment to a regional plan as outlined in 4348. The board may adopt rules to implement this section. So, um, I'm not I'm not totally sure how this would come about, but I guess when a municipality was looking at their designations for Tier 1A, potentially this would come up if they wanted to adjust the boundaries in a way that weren't addressed uh, to what to how they're addressed in the regional plan. And so it would be a simplified process. Uh, For minor changes. Yeah. Get the base. Okay. Minor civilian. So maybe this is a <clears throat> bigger question. So the future land use area is the new mapping that we're going to do or we're proposing that we're going to do. Yeah, it includes the new categories. Yeah, the mapping largely has already been done, but organizing under these categories. So, I mean, I, I have a, I have a broader question, I think for us about the term future land use area and what, you know, your average Vermonter might or might not understand that to mean. Uh, and then, Future land use district. I don't know what is the definition of that. Is that defined somewhere? No, I mean I think those those have to be consistent terms. So it probably should be area. Area because district is a different thing. So so future is just a, a term. Here that we're using, it's not actually about a time, right? It's not really like the, the word future land use maps is not really about something in the future. It's just categorizing where we are now. It's a it's a name. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think it's a somewhat aspirational in the sense that like we're we're designating land growth areas. Growth hasn't happened yet. So it's it's no, yeah. Might or might not be happening on that in that area right now. Yeah, and the the regional planning section does, I believe, say present and prospective uses of that area. Um, and so it is current, but also to be used for planning purposes. So, does it mean? <clears throat> Would Vermonters be correct in thinking that it means or understanding that it means you are using the land now in a certain way? We are proposing legislation that will change the future of how we could use this land. Um, so I don't know if the legislation itself, obviously, is re relevant because that's what you're talking about, but this is a process that the regional planning commissions already do that is sort of inherently what the regional plan reflects. Do they already call it future land use maps? Yeah. That's helpful. So then it's something that's widely understood already. Yeah, I do think it's an, I do find it to be an odd term, but yes, it does sort of reflect where the where the uses should be located into the future. So there may be a change as they go through the regional planning process. Um, yeah. A couple of word suggestions. I think future in line three, future land use, maybe you should say future land use map area. 
Um, and then on line 10, we say future land use district consisting of less than 10 acres. And then I'm wondering on line 11, it's capital designated area. I think that's going back to the more of the ACCD world. And it's kind of a different thing. And does it belong here? Um, and if so, yeah. Um, No, I agree. I think this is an awkwardly drafted section. Um, so the designated areas will be tied to how the Regional Planning Commission has mapped them. Hmm. There, but designated area plan is, you know, what is that? It is. Representative Sibelia. It's confusing. It's for this. It's it's such such. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Buffer. I think it means if the language were consistent, this would say a minor amendment to a future land use map area shall not require. So that's what we're talking about, which is what he said. So, in a way, this whole sentence is maybe redundant. But we're not talking about we're not talking about the designation program, certainly, which is your point. We're talking about. That's capital sense, actually. It's, am I wrong? Is that sense just redundant to what you said above? So I don't think it is. Okay. I do want to seek clarification from people in the room who may have worked on this language because uh, the other categories on the map may not have to do with the designated areas. Yeah. That's one thing. And also seeking community revitalization board approval or consultation. So this seems like we might need to just um, clear it up like separate editing session and then come back with it. Okay. Adam Smith. Could, maybe I missed this sometime along the from January 3rd, I don't know, but does a town have to have or a, a community revitalization board? That's a state board. That's what? That is a state board. It is, okay. So it, it doesn't sound like that here. It just... I believe that's but the proposed that, new name, right? The, but that's the answer. Board. It's the new name of the currently existing downtown board. Okay, thank you. All right. Say something? Uh, so like, we, I know it's we want. We have in the earlier sections of the bill allowed the community right, revitalization board to give comment. So it's not, it's probably oh. consistent on that one. They actually shouldn't have to. I'm sorry. They okay. shouldn't have to consult on that. Maybe beyond yeah. their scope, but because what well, anyway. So you are making changes, right? In the the next forty pages of this bill, you're making changes to the designated area program and to how it functions. And so I do think there's. I think here is trying to say that if a, a minor change that's being made affects a designated area plan. Um, that doesn't need it. that falls under what is a minor amendment. So potentially like a boundary because there's a somewhat automatic designation that happens now with the designated areas under the new language. I stand by what I said. This is trying to do a couple of things at once and we just need to clarify whether they belong together. So let's Move on. So, how will we do that? Um, we're going to come back to it. Yeah, we're going to. I'll work on it, and we'll get some new language and look at the next draft. Um. So, uh, K is then affirmative determination, regional plan. 
uh, shall remain in effect until the end of the period for the expiration or readoption for which it applied. Uh, regional planning commission shall be provided up to 18 months from a negative determination to obtain an affirmative determination. That's if they need to take corrective action to their plan. Uh, if they don't, uh, member municipalities shall lose benefits related to designations, Act 250, and, or state infrastructure investments. That's the question. Six. Upon a. Yeah, so uh, this is not a current <coughs> construct because currently the board does not review, right? So this is new. Yeah. So. I feel like this is kind of this illustrates some some questions that I have around. We've heard some testimony about the relationship changing between municipalities and the RPCs and the RPCs and the NRB. And here, are we providing any notice? To they have eighteen months. Yeah. Right. So so negative would, determination. And how would the municipalities do that? So they're going to have to go through an amendment process to the regional plan, and that does, I think, default back to the strictures of that process. Right. So which does require at least uh, two public hearings and notice, because that would be an amendment. Changes to the regional plan would be an amendment to the regional plan. There is a statutory process for what has to happen for that. And so that's why, um, I don't know if 18 months is the exact amount of time you want to give them, but you need to give them enough time to go through their readoption, their amendment process. So is it possible that the RPC uh, just might not go through the process? I mean, that's yes. the... So, I mean, just I, I, my question is more around um, municipalities who stand to lose potentially benefits. Just notice in this. Um, well, their member, the RPC board is, are the municipalities. And in some, like in my RPC, we have a hard time with quorums and making sure that people are attending. So that's one of the issues that I've been highlighting. And so here, you know, I just wonder about maybe um, written notice or <clears throat> so, some other appropriate notice, notice in the paper. I don't know. So last week we talked about the steps that an RPC has to go to, to a, the, the many steps. This is the last sort of step. So. I think it's implicit here that if they're making changes to the regional plan because the ERB gave them feedback that they have to, that they would have to go through the statutory process that does require notice and public hearings. So if you'd like to specific, like specifically add that to the reference to that, I think you can. So my, I think my question was more around what if they don't? So the NFB or the ERB says, you know, does not give them an affirmative determination. You know, let's just assume that potentially there could one day be an RPC that is not high flying. Uh, you know, we have municipalities that are dependent upon them. And so, so it's, I hear you, and that's reassuring the plant, the appeal process, all of that. So are you, are you asking if they bring back to the ERB a plan that they for an appeal? This, so in this situation, the RP, the ERB has said you didn't follow the statute. Your plan does not match the requirements. Go back and work on your plan. Here's our list, our, here's a li our, our suggested modifications. So I do think that implies that they have to go through the adoption process to adopt new elements of the uh, plan. So are you asking if they ignore the procedural steps but adopt the, the substance? 
but this is not appearing for the NRB is check. This is under objections, right? No. No. Well, the NRB denying a regional plan. This is under them denying a regional plan. Yeah. Okay. 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 So on page 76, upon approval by the ERB, the plan shall be considered duly adopted, take effect, and is not appealable. The plan shall be immediately submitted to the entities that require notice under subsection D. So not appealable. Um, to the court. Is there any, um, who is potentially harmed by this not being appealable to the court? So you've got a process that's come from the bottom up in theory, municipalities working with the RPC, RPC working with the NRB. So as long as we have good, as long as, people in that RPC region and right? those municipalities are aware of what's happening and engaged. So is there anywhere in this process that we have contemplated, um, you know, we have these new maps and new tiers that we're contemplating um, where we have um, also contemplated providing notice um, about jurisdiction to each property owner. So potentially we have um, property owners whose, who, whose property will be going into an automatic jurisdiction by 250, but you're providing them notice anywhere on this, in this bill. So, I'm not remembering off the top of my head. So the language regarding tier three, or even tier one, really. I mean, you know, like that we're that we're explaining, but I'm definitely concerned about tier three or the tiers. Just okay. So. I um anyone who again uh owns or occupies property within a proposed tier one A is allowed to appeal. Um the current, so the, the notice requirements for tier 1A are on page 54 into 55. So the municipality has to publish notice 30 days and 15 days in advance of a board, of the board's meeting in a newspaper. And then they have to also deliver it to ANR, Historic Preservation, Agency of Ag, Agency of Transportation, Regional Planning Commission, Regional Development Corporations, and then those providing educational police and fire services. They also have to, it also has to be posted in or near the municipal clerk's office and at least two other designated public places and on the website of the municipality and the Regional Planning Commission. So no, it is not being Notice is not being specifically required to landowners or residers. Can you think of another example where we are passing a law that impacts every, potentially impacts every property in the state 
where we don't give notice, like individual specific notice to those folks. I realize that if my zoning changed on my property and my town didn't give me notice. Last town plan update and zoning update. I think it happens a lot. With that, let's take a five minute break. All right, we're reconvening our meeting on H687 draft 4.1 and continuing with the conversation that was focused on notice to property owners about patriot land use maps and potential Act 250 jurisdiction. Do we happen to have a regional planner in the room? Representative Sevilla. Yeah, may I just re, uh, actually reorient the origin of this conversation was actually um, to the uh, plan uh, not being appealable to the Environmental Review Board. And so uh, just wanting to understand who uh, might be potentially impacted by that, um, considering the significant proposals we have here around jurisdictional mapping. <laughs> and we were talking about, I asked the question of, uh, is there any other proposal? What's that? Go ahead. Um, is there any other um, legislation that we have seen where we are impacting every property and not providing notice? And I think we talked about the notices that are inherent in that regional plan process as it is now, which we are changing, proposing to change significantly. And I think the chair noted that her zoning changed with that her being notified. So Charlie, can you speak to that? How does notification to landowners happen now? Well, first of all, the first part of the question is we're on page 76, line four, um, approval of a regional plan and it's dual, dual adoption and it's not appealable, which I think is a, um, you know, policy question for us to consider first. Um, and right now, what happens if there's a disgruntled resident in a regional planning area that doesn't like the plan? Um, uh, apology, sorry, uh, for the record, Charlie Baker, uh, on behalf of the Vermont Association of Planning Development Agencies, uh, apologies for not being able to get here sooner. Um, I think the there was an effort to try to address this on page 73 with objections of interested parties. Um, and so the way I understand this is uh, phrased now in these uh, couple, two or three sections here, is that anyone who's aggrieved of the decision by the Regional Planning Commission would raise that objection, bring it to the ERB. So the plan could be appealed in that way or the objection raised to the ERB. Um, and those, that's where those things will get sorted out at the ERB so that the ERB is, has eyes wide open. If there are issues that were not resolved at the Regional Planning Commission level, the ERB will have to do their best to resolve them. So but that is a policy choice. As, as how is that different than the current process for approving plans? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, currently, the Regional Planning Commission uh, uh, adopts their plan, and that's the end of the road. There's no appeal, no objection process. It just is approved by the Regional Planning Commission, and that's it. You have a majority of towns. Oh, there's that 60% of towns can vote. I, I'm not aware, sorry. You're right, that provision does exist. I'm not aware that that provision has ever been used in the state, which is a heavy, that's in lots of ways heavier than an objection or an appeal that requires the more a super majority of towns in every region to get together on one position. Which I think in my region, I think maybe 30 years ago, we had like one or two towns object to a regional plan, uh, but they couldn't get to 60%, right? And so we were trying to reduce the bar in that way. So any municipality, any person 
could raise an objection and have considered at the ERB. our appeal rights that exist today in a regional planning process. And then to the question of changes for zoning, how do towns typically let people know about that? Okay. Final is that public forums? And also, uh, we used to say that you had to put a classified ad in the paper, but uh, I think there's still some of that, you know, put it in a paper advertisement um, at public hearings. But plan process. So <clears throat> they don't get seen. Public notices. If they put, we talked about it last week. If one public notice, thirty days out, in twenty three days, people have forgotten about it. Yeah. Representative Civilian. Yeah, I would also note with zoning. Um, I think it's incumbent upon the locally elected bodies to make sure that their constituents are aware of significant zoning changes, um, because there are consequences to um, not doing so. And I'm not sure that that's the case in this situation. So who would um, people in region hold accountable for lack of adequate notice? Yeah, go ahead. Charles. Uh, yeah, Charles Baker. Uh, yeah, I think this in a similar vein that municipalities and those elected leaders have to do the best job they can in, in having community meetings and notifying the public. I think the RPCs would have that same obligation across their communities uh, as we're particularly, and I, I, I don't, sorry, I'm not familiar with whatever you may have talked about in terms of what's going to be a jurisdictional trigger at this point, but certainly, uh, you know, where we're talking about the tier 1B and whatever, if there's a tier 3 in here, there's going to have to be a lot of meetings. Uh, I think I've uh, testified you know, in the weeks previous. I think we're going to have you know tens and tens of meetings. You know, multiple meetings to try to make sure, do our best to make sure there's awareness and involvement. And it's in our self interest to try to bubble up issues, right? Because if there's concerns or issues, we'd rather get it dealt with when we're developing the plan rather than afterwards. So I appreciate that, and particularly talking about Tier One A. Um, you may not be surprised to learn that I'm actually thinking about tier three. Yeah, tier one B and three is what I said. I'm sorry. You said tier one B and three? And three, yes. That, at least that was the last version I saw. So, that, that, those are the jurisdictional decisions that are coming out of the regional plan. The tier one A is a municipal process to the ERB. To my question, <clears throat> who can people hold account? That, you know, the chair, I think, raised a very good point, you know, her zoning board changed the rules. But if people in her town, if that was not done with proper notice and with the people's will, um, there's a remedy for that. What is the remedy in this case? So who can be held accountable and how? But, so Yeah, I think you have the regional planning commission, you have the towns and make all those appointments to the Regional Planning Commission, and then you have the ERB, of course, making the decision. You know, I, I think there's a number, if I'm understanding this correctly, I think there's a number of ways to potentially address the concern that I'm having in this moment, which is um, something that, you know, we've talked with you, Charlie, about and the other RPCs, about thinking more about that kind of overarching accountability and consistency, um, and I guess the relationship with uh, ERB and or whomever um, as these relationships are changing. Um, but I think it's really, we, it's really important that we think about these things. Um, these are pretty, significant changes. I guess, Matt, Madam Chair, I guess I've just...
I don't have a suggestion here, um, but I guess I'll keep thinking about what there might be. I think it's tied to the broader question around um, accountability with the RPCs and the relationship between the municipalities, the RPCs, and the state. Yeah, which, I mean, I... Yes. the point of creating the Environmental Review Board in some regards is that accountability that doesn't exist today, standing up the board to do that. So, okay. we just went through the objection process and the accountability piece of it. Let's keep moving on. Um, so on page 76, subsection N, uh, regional plans may be reviewed, uh, as specifically enabled in 4348, minor amendments to the designated areas do not require the amendment of a regional plan. All minor amendments to future land use areas shall become piled and included in the next iteration of the regional plan. Uh, and then on to page 77, Regional Planning Commission shall adopt a regional plan in conformance by December 31st, 2026. And so I have a question on this around that date. 77, get to it. Um, and uh, in particular, I would like to hear from um, NBDA, which has 55 towns, that um, their ability to do this by this date, um, if they have the resources, both um, human and financial right now, and if they don't, um, what will be necessary? And, you know, I, I guess I would like to hear that from all the RPCs, but in particular, the largest RPC. Okay. So the next section, section 34, is 4348, which is the elements of the regional plan. The changes are being, multiple changes are being made in here to what needs to be on the regional plan. And the new language is on page 79. So you have included a reference um, to Vermont Conservation Design, as you will recall, on page 77. Um, the, and then there is already language about some of the things that are already included in the future land use maps. It's adding some more detail to that. And then on page 78, the language is being struck and then sort of reconfigured to address some of these other elements. And then on page 79, there's new language, so preservation of rare and irreplaceable natural areas, scenic and historic features and resources, and protection and improvement of the quality of waters of the state to be used in the development and furtherance of the applicable basin plans established by ANR under 1253. Mr. Bailey has a question. Um, lines 10 through 14 on page 77. Can you just walk me through how this uh, is a change from current practice? So there is already a, oh, there's an already a land use element required. This, and it does usually it does involve maps. And so this is adding specific reference to ecosystem function consistent with Vermont conservation design. Uh, and it shall support compact centers surrounded by rural and working lands. 
And then it goes into the individual elements that will be needed to address in those uh, maps. And it includes a lot of specific types of natural features. So the reference to Vermont conservation design is new. I don't know if the RPCs have done that at, ever before. <clears throat> um, but then the reference to compact centers surrounded by rural and working land is already uh, referenced as part of 4302. So I think the primary changes explicit reference to Vermont conservation design. And, and so when it says consistent with Vermont conservation, so the map will be consistent with Vermont conservation design. So how would you do that? Just by how? Um, it is map. The Vermont conservation design is, is a map. So you look at the map. And so then my question is, if we're looking at the Vermont conservation design map, have we already mapped the state? Well, we've taken testimony about the need for that map to have kind of in, um, more uh, a finer. <laughs> resolution. For some reason, that is not the word rolling on my mouth today. Find resolution data that's more locally grounded. And it'd be helpful, I think, to hear. I'm curious, Charlie, how we've asked towns to map forest blocks and habitat connectors a few years ago, and they're doing that work. And, and how is that, how have regional planning commissions helped with that work? And how has, has that changed how you currently do future land use maps at all? Thanks, Madam Chair. A couple things. Yes, the, the forest section is uh, now paragraph C under this little subsection. So that, that's what was added, uh, was that Act 171, six or seven years ago? Uh, <clears throat> make the forest blocks. Yeah. And that's in the regional plan now too. Yeah, that got added at the same time. So yeah, so after that law, we started doing uh, more with the for with this, I think particularly paragraph C there. Yeah. I think, the, I'm not sure if the ag section was there already or not. Um, and, to be clear, what's happening in this section is trying to, this was future land use that kind of had everything within it. So the notion here is splitting, splitting it apart into two parts so that this is much more focused on natural resources and working lands in this section. And then there's a new section just on future land use because we're getting much more specific under paragraph 12 a couple of pages later, right? So that's, that's why you see some of the language that is more about where things are developed struck out of this section because this is intended to be the planning basis in our regional plan for the natural resources and working lands, mapping and policies and analysis. I recall your testimony on some changes that maybe said several versions back. Yeah, we're striking this here and putting it somewhere else, but right. I think that note has not carried over to 4.1 for me. So I appreciate you. Yes. And then, sorry, this section was, there was another little section down below number six that you see is struck out page 80. That language got pulled up here also into this natural resources and working lands because it was about the rare and irreplaceable natural areas, scenic historic features, and then the uh, quality waters, the high quality waters in the state. We're trying to pull all that natural resource, resource uh, direction together so that it kind of hangs together better. That orientation. So, D e and E are not new, they're just moved. Exactly. Uh, but in 2 and 2A, we do have new language. Yes. Is that in Bongards? Do we? Um, I just, I think if these are notes I might to myself, um, but in A, <clears throat> you say forests, wetlands, oral pools, where are those place naturalized. Do we also want to add to that list connecting habitat and slope slopes? Okay. Habitat connectors is in that paragraph. Yeah. Gotta keep going down further. Okay. We want to add steep slopes. <laughs> So 
So I will say that you could, um, that in later in the section, so he was just referencing in 12, there it, it's tier three is supposed to line up with rural conservation area as mapped. And so I do think they will have to look at the definition of tier three and include those elements in their mapping of it. So I think it's already covered, but if you, but it does, I guess, depend on where you're landing on the definition of tier three. Yeah, I mean, I think we're moving away from the direct link here okay. on these, on the future land use map in the tier three. So I, okay. I don't want to late that. Representative Sudelia. Yeah, that was, was yeah. yeah, that's going to be my exact question. Yeah, when we're thinking about the tiers, just trying to, maybe it's not my exact question, but it's definitely the area that I'm trying to understand and grapple with here. But, you know, these are elements. Um, we're going to have a map, which um, we're going to have a map of tiers, land use. So we have a bunch of maps now. And the tiers are going to be based on definitions. And then we also have these elements. And yeah, the, the future land use map and the mapping here and the natural resource mapping, it's all like, for me, it's regional plans, regional planning process supporting the communities, then having better data and using it to integrate into their plans. Separate from the tiers of statewide jurisdiction of Act 250. Informing that, but not, not direct piece of it. Is so there good mapping, good decisions locally, and then feeding into however towns want to pursue one A, one B, and how we as a committee define the tier three process. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, 115 starts off by uh, indicating areas sufficient natural resource, including proposed for forest. I crossed that out in mine, actually. Yeah, I read sure. it over the weekend and I said, like, yeah, thank you. Yeah. How do you propose? You don't propose a forest. I propose and, a forest, but maybe the trees yeah. grew up since then and we're not. <laughs> and anymore. Vernal pools. I have vernal pools around my, my camp and they fill up with frog's eggs mm. and then they dry up and little tadpoles are just laying there stiff. So, uh, is this an idea of trying to protect vernal pools? Vernal pools are already pretty protected. I mean, they're an important they're they're important for amphibians. They don't always work, as you no, they know. don't. But but they do often <clears throat> work. So we yes, they're already a, an important wetland. Uh, I I agree with that. But yeah. there's a limit to what you can protect. Over you can't protect a vernal pool if, unless it's raining all summer long. It's just a map. Map. Yeah. It's what? It's just a map of where they are. Yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah, I think that I would, but then we need to talk about what that means. Probably do regions or um, towns map steep slopes now? I think that you know, there's been enough flexibility. There probably are some. Uh, it depends. I don't. I don't know the answer to that question directly. It's possible that they are. I don't think there's anything here that precludes them from bringing in other players that they think might pertain to natural resource issues. Right. And the way this section is kind of structured, there's kind of uh, you look at these elements. You do a lot of analysis about different topics. You know, we're focused here on the the natural ones, but there's also ones on community services and, and where uh, housing should be, uh, housing element, energy element. We look at all these elements and then we kind of purposely put the map last because that should be informed by all the analysis you get on all those different, from all those different perspectives. But the future land use map, yeah. right? Last. Yeah, that's why it's in that makes sense. Yep. We're looking at 11 other things before we get there. So. Yeah, and so then how does that, 
get reconciled with Vermont conservation design. That that description was helpful, Charlie. Thank you. Um, how does that get reconciled with? I, the way I'm reading this Vermont conservation design, we're just being asked to specifically look at that work that ANR has done to figure out how that should inform our our regional plan. So I don't, I don't think there's a clear. I don't have a clear answer on that. We're, we're just directed to look at it and use it to inform our plan. Right. It says to be consistent with that. Yeah. We certainly don't want it to be inconsistent with the Vermont conservation design. Right. I'm not a lawyer, but you know, that's there's a little bit of subjectivity and consistency, right? So it's not the same as, but to just adopt those maps. <laughs> not really there. We're supposed to put some thought into it. I say that well, I say we broad we regional planning commissions and all the public process that goes into that. It makes the determination if it's consistent. Oh, the ERB. ERB. The ERB. And so you do so that's so, so how do you achieve the goal? How do you meet the need with the ERB? The ERB is like, how, how is that trickling down to the planning commissions? Yes, are we, well, just the consistency, like, you know, if there's something that you could get turned down for, you know, where's your opportunity ahead of time to know how to mitigate that? Or, or, have a problem highlighted for. There is a process we've already talked about for um, pre-application review of the regional Great. plan and recommendations from the staff. Great. Great. And there will be guidance. Rules, perhaps. You want to add steep slopes here? I do, but I think we need to get. Um, we've heard from a couple of our ecology um, experts with written testimony on their suggestions for what we were kind of defining. What I think this is significant natural resources, and so ask them to weigh in on that. And so we'll look at what that would mean. Steep slopes, yes. I don't know if we will want or need to go to like 15%, 20%, maybe it will be by region. Um, so that's a piece we need to look at. It's been submitted and think about it. And, you know, we learned that some towns are doing it and using different slopes. But I think, anyway, Eric Sorensen and Liz Thompson weighed in with some suggestions on what a steep slope might be and how to use it. So we'll look to that. Okay, um, so as was just mentioned, uh, the language that's highlighted on the bottom of page 80 into 81 is what's been moved to that page on 79. And then on page 81 is where the list of categories starts. So <clears throat> subsection 12 is a future land use element based upon the elements in the section that sets forth the present and prospective location, amount, intensity, and character of such land uses in relation to the provision of necessary community facilities and services that consist of a map delineating future land use area boundaries for the land uses in subdivisions A through J, which follow this, as appropriate and any other special land use category the Regional Planning Commission deems necessary. Descriptions of intended future land uses and policies intended to support the implementation of the future land use element using the following land use categories. <clears throat> Uh, in 12, I know I've asked this question before, 
um, necessary community facilities and services? Is that a definition? Is that is that defined anywhere? I don't think so, um, though I don't know off the top of my head. Also, in uh, paragraph five on page eighty, you get the cross references to things so that we know what or define definition of it in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> sure. As out, so like, as outlined in subdivision five, <clears throat> uh, line eight into nine. So, provision of necessary community facilities and services, as outlined or. It's not really defined, but. So, Charlie, can you speak a little bit to like right now the future land use element map? Um, like these are the preceding numbered sections are all parts of that, right? They're all part of it. So we have to refer back to all of them, like transportation. And that seems like we just have, we're in the same section of the statute. So then. The answer to the question of what is a necessary community facility and services is not just five, it's three, four, and five, or one, two, five. I think it's going to be different for different communities and it's based kind of on common sense, like what's happening in your town and where, what's your future? What do you, you're mapping your future here. What are the elements that are necessary for your future? Okay, then maybe if we intend to give a lot of flexibility here. So my concern is that we don't maybe being more specific about that. Um, they like as determined by each community. After services, necessary community facilities and services as determined by each community. I don't know if this is constructive or not, but this is a general statement trying to. Uh, Proceed the following much more specific descriptors for each of the land use areas on the map. And some of those have very specific community facility requirements. Like you must have sewer, you must have water. So this was just trying to be, I think you're right, it is general, but it's just trying to gener generally set up the fact that there may be some specific facilities you need to have for uh, like downtown or village center or the land growth area. So I guess overall, and it'll be hard for me to come back with language on this since I'm still not exactly clear on what it means. And I've heard several ideas of what it might mean um, is I just, I think that it's, it feels like it's kind of open for interpretation and like the people um, that I represent, you know, they may have an idea about what are necessary community facilities and services. We don't actually envision as being something we want in our town plan or that is acceptable in our town plan. So I just like the language, I think, is to be a little clearer. And, and I don't know how to get that's yeah. why I've been asking about the definition. So I make sure I understand. Yeah, and I was trying to be helpful. I think the, the definition below will hopefully get to that more specific description of what each future land use area actually has or should have. There was a section titled Community Facilities and Services. I mean, then each of the, uh, the each of the land use categories below. Yes. 
Um, it just it just says that like the village is not uh, like for the village center, you don't have to have municipal water wastewater zoning. Uh, under the planned growth area, you have to have uh, public water, wastewater, multimodal transportation. So that's as specific as gotten so far. This is language that came from the RPCs. Yes, uh, this was largely the product of our uh, summer study. Uh, with with some modifications with as discussed in the committee over the last few weeks. So we move on and work with the RPCs on better understanding this and seeing if there's some way to clarify. Be great. Let's get to the definitions or the categories below. All right, so then there are categories A through J. Um, I have read through them with you previously, though there are changes in them. Um, do you want me to just read through all of them? Could you? Yeah. Maybe it's a question for uh, Chris and Jacob. Um, I thought Newtown Center was going away. They're not part of. What says previously designated? Oh, previous, I'm sorry. Okay. For the record, uh, Jacob Bremer, Department of Housing Community Development, uh, the, the intent of the designation legislation of this is that there be investing of the existing Newtown Centers. Uh, but that uh, the new uh, centers would not be recognized for designation. And, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so just, okay. And the reason being, we, the focus of the revitalization program is historic centers. There's not enough money to serve them. That's always been the priority of the program, so we want to keep the focus on them and not Continue to invest in places and we can't even take care of what we have. So I think focusing on the changes, right? Representatives to do. Yeah. So uh, on line 17, I have a note here that a previous, in a previous version, we struck hamlets, and I can't remember which study it was in. I think it was in the necessary changes. <laughs> study maybe it was in BAPTA. <clears throat> Um, and wondering why we are striking now. Uh, Charlie Baker, uh, to speak to that, I think that was, uh, Hamlet was a bad copy-paste thing. It kind of got carried over for something else. But in this downtown village center, um, <clears throat> we were trying to make a distinction between Hamlets, which are out there in the landscape, versus those villages that, that meet the criteria and qualify for village center designation. So there's another land use category specifically for hamlets, but those hamlets uh, at the moment may not meet the village center criteria. Great. Thank you. Um. So just to be clear then, this downtown or village center's definition is built specifically with the designation programs in mind. And it says that. Uh, new language is added at the bottom of 81 into 82. Village centers are not required to have municipal water, wastewater, zoning, or subdivision bylaws. Just realizing the existing standards. Plan growth areas. Um, language. So there's new language on starting on line 
uh, eight into nine. Uh, it adds reference to the other designated areas. And these areas should generally meet the smart growth principles in chapter 139. Uh, why are we taking a historic? Because we're, go ahead, Chris, Chris or Jacob. Well, I think it's a little, I think it's a little awkward to say historic or new town center um, when the other areas capture what may be considered historic. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's, they're defined as historic centers elsewhere. What, what is defined as historic centers elsewhere? I, I, the, the downtowns and village centers are traditional centers, so they kind of have historic features in them. Sure. I don't think the adding or the leading the word historic helps or changes anything. The plant growth area is not um, part of the designation program, so I I have a little longer answer to that. The plan growth area is intended the way this is written to be uh, the area that uh, we've also been calling 1B in the designation program they've been calling the neighborhood area. I think this would qualify for. So there, there is a designation. Um, and then this is also the area that municipality might uh, come forward with a 1A application. So this, this is tied into the designation layers also. There are criteria for becoming, um, receiving a 1A or 1B, um, we call it a designation, that fields the same. Um, and this is about the future land use maps, right? Where we are. Yeah. And so, would you possibly be mapping prospective 1B or 1A, or are, do these areas already all exist? Uh, these areas already exist. We tried to add, you can see the sub criteria, one, two, three, however many that is, through seven at least on the next page, um, was born on the conversations that happened here to be more specific so that um, when this map gets, this area gets approved by the ERB, it would be the 1B area. And so that's, that's I think you probably already covered that in, under the ERB section. This is the 1B area mapping. Okay, so it would not be perspective. Like this could be, it would be, this is a 1B area. Yeah. And if you wanted, if there was a new 1B area that came in after the maps, that's where we would be looking at a potential. Yeah, because towns can move up the scale here, right? They can go from a village and have more infrastructure, or more zoning, or whatever, and move up the scale here. So that is the intention. And it is perspective. Sorry, I don't know if I'm answering your question. You didn't really ask, but it is perspective for 1A uh, designations. Um, this is, We're basically indicating this area of the town is probably meets or could meet if the town does all the work the criteria for 1A, if the town chooses to go through that process with the ERB. So it would be within these mapped areas. Why would we do that for 1A and 1B? And if that's a policy choice, then do, do why what? would we do perspective for 1A, but not for 1B? Oh, because it was a, it's a higher level of um, Active 50 exemption, right? 1B was intended to be, I think, is the way I'm understanding it, some uh, modest level of exemption from Act 250 that we, you could get, a, I'm going to say automatically, knowing it's not automatic because there's a lot of process that happens before that, but um, in a simpler fashion uh, that we could do also uh, and kind of have designations for the village centers, downtown, downtowns, and neighborhoods kind of happen all at once in a region to get to those base levels of designation. <laughs> and again, if they want to get more Act 250 exemption, 
there's more process for the town to go through. If they want to get higher designation benefits, there's more process for them to go through. So we're just kind of setting the stage. There's potentially a lot more 1Bs than 1As. Uh, yeah, 1B is intended to be more inclusive than 1A. Yep. Okay. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, good job, Chuck. What would Chris say? Your section, how about? Oh, no, no, no. Um, so then, in light of that information, um, we may want to check if. So, last week you did have a conversation about Tier 1B, and I think. So, the language that's highlighted on 17 and 18 says served by municipal water and wastewater infrastructure. Um, I'm guess I'm. I'm wondering, I think you landed on or. Okay. I don't remember if you landed on soil. No, we leave that out. And the other piece we did one in, if this is the place to have it, is the towns need to confirm they want to be a 1B with the regional planning process. Yeah, the option of I will note that the village area was intended to be the lowest level of 1B, and that's where uh, there was language about uh, just, uh, oh, I take that back. Sorry, catching up to where you are. Well, oh, that's where the soil was, was in the village area. Sorry. Um. Well, all right. I'm just, I want to make, so I did not know that this was inherently 1B, just so you know. Um, so I do think, uh, well, what, and what you just said, Madam Chair, about making sure that the town has indicated, I guess I'm wondering, because I'm wondering where that information should live. And we, we talked about it last week and we put it somewhere in the previous it's in the ERB section. It is the okay. ability to opt out of the exemption. Right. Okay. So when that happens and where. Okay. I think that, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Well, we just need to make sure that we don't need to also say it here. Like, but yes, that. Yeah. And because this is the actual map, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I think, wouldn't it? Well, I guess what just to. Maybe clarify further. I, for me, these are the these are potentially the one B areas, but a town could still have a plan growth area that they didn't want an Act Two Fifty exemption for. And so, for me, they're not they're not one hundred percent lined up. That's why the town needs to say, "Yeah, we want to do this," or not, and that's fine. It's good. You could still say this is a village that we have water in. It's a plan growth area. But we would like to keep the jurisdiction the way it is at, at the Act 250. And that's great. Fine. They can do that. But that that's the my intent. I'm seeing a lot of nods. I so I would ask um, you in particular, but all yeah. of us to look for that to make sure that's happening. Yeah, I mean, I think to me it does make sense to have that be part of that section in the Act 250 statute about that designation. Um, and looking back in my notes, it does seem we did talk about that. So yeah, um, yeah. So I think that is where you got language about how the towns opt out of that for one B. Okay. So. See, it says to find it 4303, which I'm not seeing here. I bet you know what that is. I do. So my question is, I have a very specifically, I have a town that has written to us that's struggling to deal with water that um, has um, the need to either have a public water system or a public sewer system because they're built up on top of each other. And they've really struggled with that question. And they're, they've resolved this issue with a 
commercial um, uh, sized tank, basically, um, in their village. So, <clears throat> what, what is the definition of uh, municipal sewer? Well, so actually, it's an interesting question because as I had drafted it here, it's this area is super municipal water and wastewater infrastructure as defined in 4303. So you may recall that last year you passed this definition of area served by municipal water and sewer. It's in 4303 and it is a kind of a subjective definition where the municipality gets to define areas that they believe are included in their area served by municipal water and sewer. And that's because that definition is primarily used for requiring density under zoning. So you may want to sever this language from that definition. So that's one thing. Well, because it's, those are defined areas that the municipality has sort of outlined. It, it, may, it may actually be tied to direct and indirect discharge wastewater systems. Um, you read us that definition again. Very long. Mm -hmm. It's an entire page. So, I mean. That, that we did last year. Yes, I mean, it was drafted by Senate Economic Development, but it came to your committee last year as part of the Home Act. Um, and so it sort of sets up this construct where um, it either means the area actu where actual connections are available to existing systems or where the municipality has the ability to adopt a, an ordinance or bylaws that establishes what those areas are and can exclude things from them. Actually, I think we added that flexibility yeah. in our committee. Yeah. We did that because we, there were places that perhaps never should have been served by water and sewer where the town is not encouraging growth currently. So that that's where that came from. I remember that now. So let's think about how that relates. <clears throat> I think that's fine. I think it's fine because it's the same thing. Towns have a right to, they're, they're, these are their growth areas. They're deciding. So they can decide. So I guess it's, are there, are there standards of like for, for the sewer system or water system, I guess is a more technical oh, yeah. answer. It's well, that's state what I mean. standards for that. So sorry. So I'm, I sort of mean that it's because the, the term is defined as served by municipal water and sewer infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But if you change that to, or that no longer makes it a defined term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess I could think about that a little bit more because I hadn't thought through that. Uh, I mean, I guess you could still. Uh, uh, yeah, I would need to think about that a little yeah. bit. But about that, we can, you can think about it, and we we can. Representative Logan. Yeah, I'm. I guess along those same lines, it just seems like uh, the land growth areas planning process here is more uh, is defining land growth areas more narrowly than what we do in the designation section. Like the, the bar is higher for identifying the planned growth areas in this planning process than it is in the designation section for 1B. Right. So that's because, um, sorry, you're focused on the planned growth area, which is supposed to set the stage for 1A. It's inclusive of 1B, though. The village area was intended to be the lowest uh, future land use area for 1B. And I think that if you look at that section, maybe a little bit applicable to this or question, we're trying to have a lower bar for 1B areas in the village areas. Which and I, I thought that yeah. the planning process was where the designation for 1B was going to. Yeah. And so in another section, I can't remember if it's in the designation section or the Act 250 section, Matt, maybe in the Act, in this designation section, but it says uh, the 1B designation is the village area plus the plant growth area plus the centers. So 
for trying to be inclusive in the 1B. And you're right, the plan growth area is a higher bar for those towns that might be eligible if they want to, to get 1A. Uh, and that's why the bar is higher. Yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. Welcome to our six month conversation. Yeah. <laughs> just to try this out, and just to, I think of 1, <laughs> 1B as being the areas with, but people have been saying about 1B is they have a plan, they have bylaws, they have subdivision bylaws, and they have water or sewer. So, yeah. And that's really not the terminology for the designation program. Right, um, because that this that the what I just described are the requirements to get the exemption for the fifty units of housing, and that that's step. what it does. And that, that is that. I mean, that's so that's what that does. The designation program goes to villages. That, 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 that the first level doesn't is something other than a one B or more inclusive than a one B. The village centers. So. I just want to make sure we're not confusing our terminology here because it is confusing. The designation over my confused <laughs> makes this a little confused. But this is what we're doing here is the part that goes to the ERB and deals with um, the exemptions. And, the, and then the other program is an overlay on this that it turns out that it's more inclusive because it doesn't always have to have sewer and water or water. That's why we added the sentence in there about the village center. You know, that's really the lowest nation, right? It's fair. And then if we went up one notch to neighborhood in the designation program, that's where we were talking about. They got the bylaws in place and so sewer or water, that's like the next year, 1B. But that could include areas outside village centers. It could be a planned growth area, or it could be the downtown, just 1B. And then the highest level would be um, with the, the 1A, oh, sorry. I mean, I guess I was thinking of the 1Bs as like an area around an existing village center that, yeah. Area. Well, you just said it could be outside of that. Not outside of it. It could be also the planned growth areas, which are bigger than villages, right? Like, or it may be a large village or a city. Has those attributes. We that's right. That's, that's why it has also in some the bars high. In some towns, there will be a one B could be much bigger than it would be in other areas because it has sewer water in a larger area. There's a layering we're trying to get to. Let's just establish all the one B areas, which would be inclusive of the village areas and plant growth areas. And then uh, the plant growth area was intended to be let's who might be eligible for one A. Exemption. That's why that bar is higher. You're, con you're conflating, and they are really they're separate. They're the designation programs. And that's been saying is an overlay, but either way, they're over here. They're providing access to, to community development opportunities. Yeah. Then within, like, separate from that, you've got towns that want to be a one B and meet the criteria that Seth just laid out, or a town that wants to take on a little more and get a commercial exemption for their developments, and that's the 1A land growth here. So villages without water and sewer are not 1B. Right. OK. okay. There's a there's so Chris Cochran from the department. There's a chart that we put together that kind of lays all these out, kind of all the doors out of stone, so you can see how the different sections integrate. But... That's good. Yeah. There so, it is. Combination of the language, and at some point, would I think, Maybe minimize the condition, but it doesn't need to happen. Yeah, and I mean, we were intending this draft to have the language be consistent. We're having a hard time getting there, but we will. The hard time is really because on the in the reality, there's some towns that may want to move up and some that may not want to, and so we're trying to provide a system that has that flexibility within it uh, and not get too rigid. Right? We could make it like community. Once we do one thing, you get the exemption and you get the designation, but we knew the reality wasn't like that on the ground. So that's why, and I apologize, we we're trying to, in the interest of trying to be flexible for the reality with our communities, trying to have some flexibility in the system so they could go up or down, depending on where they were and what they wanted to do. 
This is helpful. Representative Logan. Thank you. I'm just going to. I'm going to try one more time to get some clarity here, and I think I'm almost there. I, I think what's partially confusing about this is that we have two separate designation processes yeah. going on. So we have the designation pro program under ACCD, and then we have the tiered designation program. And I'm still having a difficult, and it, our tiered designation regional, you know, like our future land use map designation process um, says what needs to be in place in order for an area to be mapped as tier 1B, and it is less. Say okay, what page you're on? 49. Line up with the village area definition, which is the 12C, page 84. Mm -hmm. Village definition area, uh, the village area definition is a little bit more lax, actually, than this definition. So I guess I'm. So this the chart that Chris just referred to is yeah. a really good visual on helping you. Get the big blocks of yeah, the parts up. Yeah, I think I'm slightly confused only because the word village is used so many times and it has slightly different meanings. So And we're also like this chart also shows, for example, that parts of village areas could end up in tier 1B, but parts of those areas could also end up in tier 2. Oh, and tier in my imagination, you made that this was working. Tier 2. Right. Where's your part of this? Yeah. And what we just heard was that villages would end up in tier 1B. Yeah. Then Not it says maybe, here, maybe. Uh, which areas okay. referred to as tier 1B. It's a little eligible for 1B. I think this was trying to get at the notion that a, a town village area may ask not to have that Act 250 exemption and want to have Act 250 fully applicable. So they wouldn't want the 1B benefit. I think that graphic does line up right with the village area of 1B. Can be the same, but up to the town again if we want to opt out. I think for consistency, we should decide. You know, like a village is maybe doesn't have to have water or sewer, which is how you've set it in the designation program in terms of feeding into it. And then you maybe. You, plan, you become a land growth area under this if you're one B and then possibly one A. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess my real question is why we would have different requirements in one section than in the other. Well, I think we're trying to line them up. I, I mean, yeah. So we're trying not to. Right. That's why I'm saying like maybe we choose the village center nomenclature for smaller mm -hmm. area, not Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's eligible for certain benefits, but doesn't meet the criteria for 1B yet. Yet, it might. It'll be eligible for help to get a water or sewer system and solve Representative Sebelius problem for her down there. That's the way I see it. Brian Shoot, did you have something to add? Right. I'm a little confused also that the designation of a village center does not require the water and sewer, but the designation of 1B does, and it doesn't seem like it's that it says that. So maybe I just read it more carefully, but it seems to be some inconsistencies between the designation section and the. Well, that's what we're talking to right now. So, 
looking for nods. The villages, to me, don't have that infrastructure yet. You want to speak to this? Or yeah. Where are you guys weighing in on this? Like, is it lowest tier, right? Just access to benefits and supports, except for old historic buildings, access to the tax credits. <laughs> Um, and there's a ladder pathway that that community wants to achieve, but that is the start off level. So village area could be a village that had a water source system and zoning bylaws and things we've talked about for the criteria to meet a 1B. That's why this little thing hangs out here. Okay. But it's important to note that the village center, which is paragraph A, doesn't need to have water sewer. There, to your point, there are some villages that are Quite normal and don't have one that was community facility. Uh, and so the definition, and so the, although the definition on page 49 of 1B so that it includes village centers and wouldn't in village centers that don't meet the requirements below. And the requirements below are those that are That's in needed. in village area. And I'm, I'm confused by the question because I think. It's on page 49 and it's on page 84 to 85 are the same definition. Which is the there. Let's we'll see where Representative Logan is here for a second. Thank oh, you. Okay. Sorry. Well, if it's timely, I have a question about on page 49 as well. Line nine. The base, the tier one B base growth area designation. Did we decide we were going to get rid of that terminology because it's not anywhere else? Yeah, I had that circled. Um, base. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I circled it thinking we'd get through the bill like we're doing right now and this, like, got to figure out. That. Give me one. There was a reason that it was there. I guess I raised it the first time. It's just. Same as We're trying to note that what the ERB is approving is some level of a growth area. Either this kind of base growth area, the so 1B, or the 1A higher level growth area, or what we call plant growth area. So, but again, yeah. oh. anyways, or, the reason I'm not in marketing. Is there a, a, a benefit um, with this change in concept? So we have this change in concept of location-based jurisdiction and the tier system. And it just seems really confusing to me to have these two um, these two designation processes, you know, like trying to make them fit. This one's for land use, and one is really about um, economic benefits. Mm economic and community development benefits. And I'm not sure that we are doing either designation. I mean, certainly it's possible, but I'm, I'm not sure that we're doing either favor by trying to make them meld together here. Representative Bonger. I actually, there's a lot to what you're saying. Um, I think what we've been trying to do here is I'll just, this is not the right, these aren't the right numbers, but is make the first 100 pages only about the former. And then the designation program actually starts on page 101. It's not the real number. It is an overlay. But the, the overlay to what we've done or solely for the purposes of the first one, which is the ERB process, um, the mapping, the the designated villages, that's then the one at one E's and the one A's. And that's, that's what we're doing now. And then the other is an overlay. And that's the way that I'm thinking about it for all the reasons you're talking about. And I guess I, I would say the reason we got here is because we started using the designation program for land use decisions. And what we're trying to do is kind of Straighten that out a little bit, but have it be complementary because they do go together. They relate. We weren't actually totally crazy as a legislative body to start doing that, <laughs> and yet we want to we want to line it up. We're doing that just adjustment right now. So it's like as we go through this, 
along the lines of what Cecilia is saying, I almost try to tune out the designation program. Yes. And this, we should which, just focus on which designation the, program. The, the second designation. Oh. It's this one over here. Um, and focus on this and then think about that as an overlay that comes in on top. But if, I mean, I, I would also add that many of the concerns that I hear you voicing are related to supporting small towns and economic development and helping them get into this. And that's why they're woven together. In my mind, that's what we're intending to do is to say, how do we get you access to the, the infrastructure assistance that you need? And it's through the designation program that that happens. I'm not sure that that is the assistance that I'm looking for. Yeah. Chris Johnson, I, I just briefly, Chris for the part. Um, yeah. Linking the designation process to the RBC map process this is something they're already doing. We're trying to automatically recognize this community. So right now, I have to come to us one at a time to seek this designation for this benefit. They do. A large majority of our communities have gone through this process, but the idea is to remove the barrier and make the access to benefits easier. So I do think it's an improvement. It's more inclusive. We're trying to help more communities achieve these broader goals. But to an extent, they need to choose their own adventure, and they have to decide that they want to take these steps. There, we didn't really have a coherent roadmap or four steps for community to follow until we have this. So, I think once you see how all these things do stack together, I think you'll see it's, it's a package that municipalities like and support. So they see where they are in it, and they see where they could go if they wanted to, with state and health assistance. I mean, I, I certainly can see the benefit of trying to make them fit together and be consistent. And, you know, that will be helpful when we tell our municipalities what we're doing here, which we haven't done yet, um, and help them understand the processes that we can, that maybe will be beneficial to them going forward. I, I'm, I think I'm worried about... Um, just making sure we get it right. Any amount of time that we have to spend on details of that. We're working on getting it right. Representative Stone. Oh, thanks, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so what would help me personally, and I know we're working on this, but so like page 49, line nine, um, I guess it's a proposal that, that we try to be a lot more disciplined. Um, and I don't mean that, <laughs> um, my uh, RPC lead behind me isn't being disciplined, but to obtain a tier one B, uh, do we want to use the word designation? I, I mean, I, 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 it seems to me easier if we just keep it tier one A block. Tier yeah, one. We tried to B say block. tiers and designations, and then right. What if we said status instead of designation? Yeah. Well, status would be great. Yes, that's oh, good. Yes. Yes. But also we could get rid of growth area. Like yes. that is what a tier one B yeah. is. Yes. Like, uh, tier tier one A one B status. Yeah. Status. Okay. Can we get rid of tier while we're at it? Because it makes me think of RES. <laughs> we're bringing tiers in there. Label one A, label one B. We're definitely doing tier. Everybody's full of tiers. I'm getting <laughs> To obtain a tier one B status. But if we maybe just as a committee, like if every single time we see that, let's just. Yeah, yeah I think we brought that up earlier and we can double down. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it will say in the following language down yeah. that the municipalities with tier one B areas, I think in line 11, in that same paragraph. But Tier one B, they are areas. Area status, mapped areas. I mean, I That's think it's tier one B status. I think it's okay to say area. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Representative Bob. So picking up on what Rep. Stevens I think was suggesting on page eighty two, go back and forth page forty seven, eighty two. You get rid of the term growth area. And say one no, 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 because <laughs> that's conflating them. This is mapping and designations. Right. 
Okay. This isn't right. not, yeah. this okay. isn't status. Okay. This okay. isn't okay. active duty. Okay. okay, sorry, sorry. Yep. Yep. Okay. But good test of us. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Logan. Thank you. So now I think I can narrow down on my real question for this session, <laughs> which is um, my understanding is that part of this regional planning process, the result of this regional planning process will be a recommendation to the ERB on the maps. It will be providing maps to the ERB for their approval for 1B status. Mm -hmm. Correct? As mapped. As mapped. So I don't see a reference to that in the elements of the plan. Thank you. Oh, Charlie, did you want to? Yeah, it's not part of the elements, it's part of the process and the preceding section of 4348. Okay. Uh, Sorry, flipping back through those pages of back in the 70s. Yeah. I guess that's just confusing to me for some reason. Page one. Then I think it's in the Act 50 section of statute where it says, like, ERB will uh, hear, I don't know if it's a request or an application from the RPCD to approve their map to. You might. Approve, yeah, <laughs> approve one B status. So we just talked about, and you gave us the page reference, or we talked about it in the in the in the active fifty process. Page forty something. Forty nine. Yeah, that's the new one B. Yeah. Yeah, it's just coming. Yeah. Where's the section that the town opts in? I haven't tracked it yet. Okay, so we're adding that. Great. That's where you know. Okay. Is that work for you? I mean, it seems strange that it's not an element of a regional plan. The request to the ERB? No, just the. So I think it's partially because the, the Regional Planning Commission is mapping a variety of different areas. Yes. And then that's a different step is the one B. So multiple, a couple different areas could qualify as one B, depending on the layout of that town. I understand. So I'm just wondering, so it's, but that's not included in the regional plan, the areas that they've identified as one B. No. You have to get approval. They're calling it other, there's other terms. So these areas meet the criteria for 1B status. So what point in the process are the 1B maps created? Um, you're asking a very specific question, like when are we going to the ERB to get 1B? status approval, then I think it's uh, part of our uh, request to the ERB would be to describe what is on the maps that we're asking for to be included in B. There's already some statutory definition language here that would say it has to be the centers, the plan growth areas, and the village areas. So those are the three areas. Uh -huh. Could be 1B. Plus any area that has these characteristics. They should be one of those three land use areas in our regional plan. I think I'm not quite sure where you're going, but where you're making me think is where does someone find out that there are one B? Where's that map going to be? Where it seems like an overlay on town plan map to me, and do we need to spell that out in statute? Because the town has to. Meet the criteria, get approved, and then you know, and we want to do it, and then it would be on their map as a this village is a one B area. 
So you didn't, there is already language in this bill that they have to include the tier 1A on their town map. So <clears throat> tier, tier 1B probably also should be added. I think we may have talked about that. Also, there's language in at the end of the bill about the department maintaining uh, information on the various statuses. Those are the designations. Well, and I'm, but I'm wondering, so oh, if you wanted to also add that. Like that's more of the function of the planning and the, that's the whole point of separating them. And that, that if we have a place where we've said the one A's are mapped in a town map, we should have the one B's there too. So if we could add that, that would be. If, again, just I don't know, this is kind of where the regional planning and the designation studies were talking to each other a little bit last summer. Was one of the intents was to reduce the administrative burden on the smallest municipality of having to do these kind of specific applications or specific town plan amendments and ask the RPC to just include it in the regional plan map. So you can go that way. I just, I don't know, my sense, and Chris and Jacob got to speak better to the designation conversation, but there was some intent to try to reduce the administrative burden on towns to get that base layer of benefits. Well, I mean, it could happen when they update their town plan, but it seems to me you want people to know about these places. That's the, yeah. like the point of them. So if they're not publicly available on a map, yeah, that, that seems pretty basic in this day and age and to have a map of them. And get to review them and then appeal and well, I'm thinking after the fact, the review and appeal fact. happens oh, yeah, in this planning yeah. process. Right. We've already been through that part of the yeah. statute, but I thought, I mean, you, seems like something the NRB would maintain for sure, um, ERB would maintain. Hmm. Yes? Natural Resources Board, Environmental Review Board, you yeah, would sorry. maintain that. Yeah. We would, we would, I mean, if we were reviewing them and approving them, we would have a database of, of the approved maps and plans. Okay. And then you're saying that then the town map should be updated. I'm pretty sure a town that does this is going to be excited to have it on their map, but we could <laughs> That's what I was. make it clear. <laughs> okay, let's take a five minute break. All right, we're going to reconvene our hearing and continue to walk through H 687. Yeah, I think we're on page 84, maybe. Um, well, no, we haven't done 83 yet. Sorry. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> we're on 42. So over 49. So there's um, a bunch of we're just discussing the element criteria of a planned growth area. So there's new language on page 83. Um, that says uh, planned transportation infrastructure includes those investments included in the municipality's capital improvement plan program. Um, is the struck language moved somewhere else or is it just gone? Yes, we're, we are wondering what is going on with this language on 83, if you, because um, there's struck language about the transportation. I, yeah, I don't, because I don't know. Can you speak to that? Apologize for missing the question. Uh, yeah. what's, why is that sentence on line 12? Line 15 on is struck. Why is it struck? The three. This is close. Okay. I do not have a good structure statue. Okay. I've seen that language somewhere else. I think it was in previous iterations, but 
Is it, was it, it was new language that now is being struck. So it's not in statute now. It was all underlined and now it's being struck. Okay, so it's being replaced by planned transportation infrastructure includes those investments. Okay. Is that, is that being? Direction action item five. You don't know the answer to that question. Who will? Well, someone proposed the language originally, and now they have cracked it. So come on, team. Ellen, how did you get the guidance to take it out? Uh, there may have been conversations with NRC, but I thought I can't remember if that language is should yeah, you know, recommending a standard. Mm -hmm. This is kind of again back to the question of how high a bar do you want for the plant growth areas? I'm not sure now I remember. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, I think what uh, occurred was there was some discussion that 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 negative language wasn't needed. That we should say more focus on the positive idea of smart growth which was mentioned um, on page 82, lines 11, 12, kind of preceding all these criteria. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it was some discussion like that, but obviously up to you. It's on page 100. What do you say? It's on page 100. The struck language on page 83 is now on page 100. Oh, yeah, so that's the definition of smart growth. Still using negative language. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. So, so it's just smart. Mm -hmm. Here's the smart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's just... Then that brings us to page 84. So then in uh, the death in the category of village areas, um, it's adding uh, a municipal a village area shall have one of the following municipal water, wastewater, and land development regulations. If no municipal wastewater is available, the area must have soils that are adequate for wastewater disposal. So contrary to what we were just talking about. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> and so there's that piece where in the graphic where a village could be one B, but could it be could also B. be not two. Mm -hmm. I think if I have this right, village areas are the areas that are not going to be one. They, they are not necessarily one B. They're the areas that are not one B, and therefore the R is very low to gain the, or to gain the benefits from the Chris's program. But they also could be. Could be, but they don't have to have. The only thing we're saying about what the because village areas are areas that could theoretically be one B's, but they don't have the one B. Haven't met the one B. No, 
No, this is the same criteria as the 1B criteria. 40, whatever that was. It is right now. So we have to figure out if we are intending. Well, this is less. This is more lax than page 49. Yeah, it is. So some parts of some parts of a village area may end up in a 1B map. Some may not. Or some village areas, old village area. I don't know. That's so is can we hear from um either either Chris or Jacob on like the the purpose of the village centers, village areas in your designation program and who who are they intended for and what's the next if they're the lowest if they're the entry point then what's the next one up yeah so the concept of the village area is really an area uh that is uh, surrounding a, a village center um so it's anchored by historic civic and commercial core but this is a slightly broader geography um and so it would track into on, on the uh on the revitalization designation side, uh, the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and on the Act to uh, Act Two Fifty jurisdiction designation side, uh, would track into the one one B. And so it's unlocking for a broader geography than just a village center, a little bit more area around the village center. Uh, as unlocking those neighborhood benefits, you know, they could work on water or sewer or tax credits. To be clear, you have village area, neighborhood, and core in your chain in this. Okay, just because it doesn't carry the word over in the chart you gave us. But um, we can update the chart. I think that was a chart from a month ago. And Conversations in the law more. <laughs> the chart would be very helpful. And agreement first before we update the chart. No, we want to say would be even more helpful. The chart will drive agreement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the intention is for the village areas. I I think it could just be a historic village crossroads to have a low bar to entry. And they could then Come up land growth area 1B. And on your chart, I would say the distinction would be then it's a neighborhood. I mean, I don't know if that's the right word, but that's what we have now. Okay. So I think we should really be careful to not conflate the terms so that they're clear in our heads and in the folks who are going to be administering all. Representative Tori. Just to clarify, I'm recalling when we had Catherine in here and she showed the, that town with the village area that had all, all this infrastructure. She called it a village area, but it's really 1A in terms of what it has. So would that be a planned growth area instead of a village area? The example she used. You guys remember that? I don't. I do remember. I, I remember. I remember. I remember, I remember it was not as well. Oh, that was West. Yeah, Richard. I mean, it had like real, real infrastructure. Yeah, and it was. I think she was ancient. showing us. A, I think it was a intended to be a planned growth area. Yes, okay. but she used the term village area, so that's why in my mind, which is why we need to be. Mature. That's why we need to be more. Yeah. Uh, oh well, yeah. If you look at the regional future land use map section of the chart, it's got village center, village center, and village area. Yeah. That's confusing. Yeah, see, we I mean, take it away from the reality is that village centers are at core, but then we have some village centers with no infrastructure. So again, we're trying to deal with multiple situations in the real world. What did happen to Hamlet? It's got its own definition. <laughs> <laughs> what about Hamlet maybe the village area? Enclave. I love Hamlet. I think Hamlet might be a village. This Hamlet implies a lack of infrastructure to me. To be to be honest, and a village center sounds like I got some something going on underground with water and sewer. I live in an old um, center area, uh, which is probably Hamlet, which has no infrastructure. <laughs> 
Oh. I want my picture to be more to try on. This needs to be a different word. Okay. Representative. Thanks, Roger. I'm looking up what the definition of a helmet is, but um, <laughs> page 84, lines 13 and 14. Please feel free to tell me I'm just to be confused, but yeah, is this an area that we would cut the soil language? So that's what we're talking about right now. Okay. I mean, I think we should really try on a new word like Hamlet and just say there's traditional shed in my area. And, you know, child's portion of the park trails. Um, is it just on our neighborhood? <laughs> That's what we were just So Hamlet yeah. technically means a small settlement, 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 generally one smaller than a village. There you go. So oh. that's two roads. Not that. We, you know, we, that other Hamlet description mentions. <laughs> okay. Oh. I need a drink. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, I think we're going to try on a new word and we will get back to you in the next iteration. Moving on. So at the bottom of page 84 into 85, village areas must meet hamlets, it must be the following criteria, duly adopted town plan, planning process is confirmed, bylaw is adopted in accordance with the statutes, and then the river corridor bylaw language, uh, which is similar to language you've looked at before. Um, so unless the municipality has adopted flood hazard and river corridor bylaws, applicable to the entire municipality, that are consistent with the this standards established by A&R, the area excludes identified flood hazard area and, and fluvial erosion areas, except those areas containing pre-existing development in areas suitable for infill development as defined in the rule. Yeah, so we have um, B and C are crossed and we need to uncross them um, in the next draft. I think. So if the plan growth area is intended to kind of be a 1B, I don't like, I guess, you know, Charlie, you've said a 1A or 1B, but so we should decide, like we shouldn't conflate them. Plan growth area to me was the 1A eligible for 1A, but I think we were just trying to acknowledge that there may be some towns that don't want to go to 1A, even though they have all or most of the criteria, so they'd be 1B then. That's why I'm saying that, right? Recognizing that the town has to make a choice to get to 1A. So land growth area is inclusive of 1B areas, but the village areas was also below some of the 1B areas, so we're kind of stuck in the 1B. Well, in the in the in the municipal application process to the environmental review board, one A is pretty rigorous yes. and outlined in the other section of this bill. Yeah, and so I don't know how that relates to what you just described, but it's there. Yeah, Representative Levy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that is an area of clarification. I think could be helpful. Uh, on page 50, where plan growth area designate starts, maybe we just call it tier 1A status. <coughs> then you can keep plan growth area because it actually was kind of training for no, a regional plan. 50. A great suggestion. What are we doing? One A status. And my brain is not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Call I thought it was on 49. 50. 1B. 50. 50. 50. We changed to status. 1B status. Yeah. 1B is on 49. And then 1A is on page 50. Um, you up a 1A application through this plan growth area planning process. Ooh. 
Can this be sent to uh, NVDA, to David Seneker and my zoning administrator, this draft? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you could do that. I can try. Um, however, we are also making a lot of clarifications, and I would suggest perhaps the next one. Like, well, why, so that it lines up. Will I have time to wait once we get this adjusted to where we think it's going to be okay so that I can have them look at it? before we vote. <clears throat> so, Representative um, Madam Chair, was there a decision on pages 84 and 85 to swap C with B? Swap it? You were saying they were crossed. Well, I think they are. I mean, they have a lot of the same requirements. And I mean, um, I thought the concept of uh, Hamlet, I thought the concept of C was a lower bar. Yeah. But that's, yeah. No, there is a Hamlet link. There is? Yeah, on what page? Page 86. I said enclave. Oh. It's not a good word, but. <laughs> that that's that's weird. Weird. Community. District. <laughs> so. But oh, all yeah. just moved. The source. Shy. <laughs> I love this source. It doesn't say Shire. Because Shire is like a big town. Shire town is like a big town. Shire town has a courthouse. Yeah, Shire town has a courthouse and definitely water and sewer. It's our big. It's Shire town. Millbury is a Shire town. You go on to every county has a Shire town. It's one of the courthouse. It's a brewery for this. Very sure. Right. Maybe you have to. Um, okay. These are not helpful. No. Okay. Let's focus, team. Moving on. Uh, the word we found on line 13 on page 85. Um, and then the rest of the categories are on page 86 into 87. But as was just noted, Hamlet already does exist. Mm -hmm. So that's something. Well, I don't think the definition of Hamlet here that it is actually consistent with what we were talking about, I think. With the exception of, I guess, towns choosing to have it grow. <clears throat> um, yeah, then it would move up. Yeah, Representative Bonner. I have a question on page 85. Sorry, I think there's not going to be anybody on the two. Line 13. <clears throat> Transition areas. It says planned for municipal water or wastewater. Oh, yeah. Sometimes they're planned for 30 years. And it never happens. Yep. So the fact that it's planned for doesn't necessarily bring a lot of meaning to what happens on the ground. Um, and yet we're saying just because it's planned for, these areas will be transformed to higher density mixed use. We're saying that's what the town is expressing their intent to want to do with that area. And, but the reason it's not this is kind of uh, an area that may grow up to move up into a higher category, but they're not there yet. So potentially aspirational or aspirational, but can they go ahead with doing all of this dense development before the sewer or handle or water? No, it's not likely. Okay. Yeah, so 
Okay, so from D down, they're now in tier two. That 250 is. Okay. okay. I, I got it. That makes sense. Uh, Representative Sackowitz. <clears throat> I have a question about um, E on the top of page 86. We're talking about these subspaces and those areas. And, and I'm, it seems like when we're including housing at the end of the paragraph there, that we would be excluded from this category ski areas that didn't have housing. And I'm wondering if that's something that makes sense given the context. Are all these categories always including housing no matter what? Is that kind of the base? Part of the definition is there places where people live and do, but they're constructed in various ways. Yeah. So we want to keep that in. Well, no, I don't know the answer. I'm like, I'm waiting for Ellen. <laughs> Sorry, I understand yeah. the question is all I meant. It, does it exclude a ski area that doesn't have all of those elements, for example? It says include. Yeah, I think that, I think that means it's more flexible. I think so. I mean, again, a lot of, I think a lot of these categories are objective. Charlie, do you want to speak to that question? Can you? I think the intent was definitely to maybe to read that as an or. Like, I think, um, yeah, some of them have housing and you may be right, some of them may not have housing. So I don't know if it needs to be an or or provide. Yeah, all or some of the following. Maybe they're maybe it should just be an or. Yeah. Or may. I didn't put it yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. That may provide. Right. Yeah. yeah thanks for catching that. Yeah, was that? Yeah, I think we changed that to an or on line four. Um. Um, right, so the rest of the categories are enterprise areas, Hamlet, rural general, rural agricultural and forestry, and rural conservation. So I do want to flag quickly. Again, I pointed this out initially. I don't know if you, well, this is all for maps, but the the term rural general, rural agricultural, and then rural conservation specifically, I think you've had different conversations about what that, again, that yeah. title should be. So I would like to hear from Charlie about the, your conversations, like how, how much depth there were to this decision to make these three rural categories. Yeah, and it was really, I think just, uh, the reality yeah, of what uh, the regional planning commissions have been doing, where it seemed like there was some split of areas. I rural general is kind of rural, could be rural as residential, except that we also know like there's there's different, there's some retail things and some employers that are in that rural area. So we're trying not to just be too tight to keep it just residential. Uh, but there are things in the rural landscape so that's where the general then, you know, there's in the elements, we're supposed to focus in on ag and forestry. So calling that out uh, as a specific one. And then also, on uh, you know, important natural resources to protect uh, and conserve. That was where the conservation came from. Uh, so just as we were looking across the state at the different regional plans, this is kind of where we landed as something that seemed like a workable construct. You know, it could also be much more general, you know, just say rural areas, we could go back to some of that element language that has ag, forestry, and natural resources and all that, and leave it up to the mapping, but. Dude, are towns doing a, like a conservation? I think that's, or iffy, some, some are, some are. Celia. Question on uh, the, Correlation for tiers here, just making sure I understand. Tier three is J. It would be if you keep that tier three concept as it was. But, I mean, and uh, 
H and I are two. Yeah. So I has critical wildlife habitat, flood storage. Horse blocks. Representative Sackler. Yeah, in that same section, right, next, right in after flood uh, critical wildlife habitat and movement. It's not sure what. That just seems on, on line three. It just seems awkward. I'm not quite sure I know exactly what that's what they're trying to say with the word movement in that spot. Corridor? Maybe it was maybe it, maybe it was meant to say movement corridor, but habitat and corridors. So, um, there's clearly the potential for overlap, right, between mm -hmm. I and what might be in J. So there's going to need to be some judgment there that happens and through the process about what's primarily ag or forestry, like working lands versus habitat connecting. And, yeah, obviously pieces of property have all, all these things happening at once. And if I might, mm -hmm. forest blocks, how do we differentiate? Sorry, sorry if everybody knows the answer to this question. Yeah. Um, uh, between forest blocks and um, actively kind of manage is it current use versus not current use so do we have so we have forest blocks so we only mean forest blocks that are not in current use is no that, no 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 wait where are you well i'm just wondering about um so we have forest blocks here yeah. and i'm just this is working lands <laughs> Forest blocks are primarily managed and are many, most are in current use. And so I don't, those are not all, those are not exclusive, different. Those aren't differences to me. Forest blocks um, yeah, are many of them enrolled in current use and actively managed, most of them. I think it's fair to say, most of them. I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to kind of understand where we are at with this definition in I and uh, and its conclusion right now with force blocks and its potential for tier three, which potentially would be automatic jurisdiction. And I don't understand if that would be a change for um, forestry operations or, uh, or not a potential change. And if it, if it was going to be a potential change, I would want to finish. Yeah, so it, it's not envisioned to be right now. We're still working on a definition of critical resource area. In this mapping process, there was that list of things to include on the maps. Um, and I think we're leaning towards um, uh, you know, a limited definition of tier three that is um, maybe bounded by this a definition in this bill and then goes to rulemaking, right? So like, what is it that should be a critical resource that triggers Act 250? That's where we're headed. And I don't know how it quite relates to this rural conservation district. I, um, So I think I'm hearing you say that we need to do some more work on the actions and understand what this means here. Right. So, and that's why, so we're um, in thinking it through and getting assistance from separating. So it was a challenge because was the, um, it was a challenge to get to like, what are those critical resource areas when they were assumed to be uh, a large area of the state, which wasn't really the intention. It was intended to be like, are those resources that warrant like a statewide review before a development happens in or near them, right? So we'll be leaning on 
the eco ecological community to figure that out. Yeah. So we're, we're pulling this apart and thinking out loud here a little bit, but uh, I think I don't think that this uh, conservation area is like, as it relates to the maps, so forget about the critical natural resources and the statewide significance for that that'll go through the process that Jared was talking about there. We still want the maps to identify important natural resources because the one above it is it's truly the working lands, it's, and which is great, that's fine. And then um, I think we also want to have the maps and the mapping done at the regions also identify important natural resources worthy of showing up on the map and being understood. Um, and then what comes later would be out of the you know, I'll just term overlay again would be an overlay for those areas of statewide significance that would be pretty limited and truly uh, critical statewide significance. But, but I think we don't want to not in this tier two level, we, we still want the regions to map important natural resources. And, and so the elements of the regional plan under A, I just think we need to make sure that, and did you cross-reference those, Charlie, when you drafted this, that page 77, line 15, the list of resources that were mapped that are elements of a regional plan that indicates those areas. So we just make, we need to make sure that your mapping categories include those. So that's a good description of what I was trying to say. It's like maybe it's in a way it's carrying this from 7-7 seven, seven over to conservation. So showing up on your maps, the regional, the town, the local and regional maps. Does, and that, they, make, does that make sense of what I'm saying? Well, and they become maybe these are the significant resources. Yeah, areas, significant. But I don't think sure that. Yeah, uh, uh, tier three. Is it just part or just your? Yeah, I mean, we could. I mean, that is some of the work that would typically happen in like a natural resource element, the way we're talking about. Yeah. You know, I think so. There are maps in these elements too. And then we're talking about a future land use map of like, okay, and then what is, what do we want to see happen on the landscape given all these other mapping of information that fed it, right? Um, so I think, you know, the intent for that last one was to whatever, and as you use the word, the state decides, you know, however that happens through this process, through rulemaking or through some other process, we wanted to make sure, I think this is back to the communication to the public, if there is going to be jurisdictional layer here that we do map that. So yeah. I don't know, maybe there's, you know, different sets of mapping um, that are going on here, but. Well, it is, you know, I includes a lot of those significant natural resources. And so maybe J is like the way it's written now. So I think to, uh, um, well, so I, the, the, ch the change on line eight and nine to specifically reference critical resource areas is new to this draft. There was different language in the prior drafts for the rural conservation area it had some other language in it. Um, and so prior to our recent conversations regarding this, I actually thought tier three could include either I or J areas because I does encompass a lot. I think Representative Sibelia was hitting on that. It, um, so you could either tease those things to be a bit more separate if you want them to line up with the tiers, but it does seem like you're actually leaning away from that right now with where you're going. So I'm sorry if I just missed this, but it, I think you want to change what's in J to be more descriptive now to something. And I don't know if it's the prior language you want to look at or if it's a mix of things from I. Yeah, we need to look at the um, preceding. It's not Sibelia and Stebbins. 
Let's see if it left my head. Uh, no, it didn't. Okay. Um, so can you remind me, um, a lot of agriculture is exempt from Act 250, is that right? Agriculture, yes. Farming is exempt from Act 250. And are parts of forestry also exempt from Act 250? Logging is exempt from Act 250, yes. Logging entails cutting down trees? Does it entail getting to the trees? Roads, I think it does, because it in ancillary. Yes. Uh, it does include some processing as well. Um, there is a, and then the farther you get out of the foreign <clears throat> Act 250 jurisdiction attaches. Seems backwards, but also, but also not. So, yeah. Yes. Representative Stevens. Thanks. I'm just throwing out an idea. I, I to me, if I were to try and, um, you know, once we wrap up in May, uh, be all of these people interpreting this. I personally would find it more helpful if I was not as expansive, mm -hmm. and Jay, we could put a little bit more detail into. And then we could have, uh, I don't know if it's a K, but, you know, a sentence that says there may be overlap or something like, but so that it's, it's clearer, like, I mean, right now I is pretty expansive. So, and J is referencing, but anyway, throwing out that. Yeah, I think that's kind of to the idea of making it more of a significant lineup with this inventory of the significant natural Whatever the word is in here. Yeah. Natural resources. Are you contemplating a little bit of a process? Like, are we developing some maps that then get considered in rulemaking as they figure out what tier three is? I, I just, that's well, an idea. Uh, but so for me, I think I'm thinking of this as regional planning commissions are using their power, their whatever, their um, wherewithal to support the towns in getting the best natural resource data they can to do their mapping and their planning as they see fit. And then we're going to be asking the state and stakeholders to tell us like, what are the statewide, the resources of statewide significance that should be potentially be regulated under Act 250. So they're, they're sta again, they're staying separate. So it's the supporting role and refining role in the mapping as the map iterations progress that the regional planning commissions can provide to the towns to help them do their planning. And then, you know, guidance on like, and, then, and I personally feel like we're leaning towards river corridors, headwater streams kind of thing more for re like state resources of statewide significance that potentially should trigger more review in certain towns or locations. The reason I was asking that question, because whatever that state level conversation ends, we're probably going to want to update our, you know, the next time we update our map, include that specific layer, because that is going to mean something different for property owners. In the same way you might the 1A. Right. B. Yeah. Do you have one more? Or Representative Bonger. So just to be clear, the way, so the new, oh, what we were what we're now talking about for J is not tier three, it's not a jurisdictional trigger. It's talking about because we've done in the one above it, we've talked about the working it's all about the working landscape. It's about you know tractors and forestry, active forestry and logging, which is all fine, but then we need to have this category that goes with it that identifies important natural resources on our maps and they become part of a base. But without that here, we're missing actually a key element to, because even though it, those important natural resources are not necessarily gonna get elevated to tier three, they're still important that to go to maps where they are. So that's what we're talking about here. So I, I'm confused. 
it's really no different than, than a water bubble. We're saying we've got the looking landscape, then we've got important natural resources that need to be thought about and thought about for that's by the regions, yes, and jet and as yeah. areas that we need to be careful, very, very careful with because of their their importance to the ecosystem. And the list starts to be fleshed out on page 77 under significant natural resources. But you're saying we can use these categories for jurisdiction. Correct. Yeah. They're not a jurisdictional trigger. These are the yeah. pieces. Yeah. Representative Logan. Well, I'm thinking about that. Where is the jurisdiction work? The skeleton of where the jurisdictional trigger is located. Yeah, on, for, oh, right. In the 40s. 40s, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 45. <laughs> the beginning. Well, that's the definition of development, excuse me. So, no, where? 48. 48. 48. Yeah. Two pages the most visited. Yeah. Need to work on that. Okay. We will. So we're going to keep. Please. We'll come back to it. Filling in the paint in here by finishing this walkthrough, and we're keeping a list of the policy choices we need to make, and that's for them. And then work it into an extract. Um, but I'm sure. So I have like a long list of policy items that I think we all have um, somewhere in our head. Um, uh, and, you know, writ large is capacity um, for towns and RPCs. And I know we have some funding. Um, yeah, we, that's why I say we got to get through this walkthrough. Okay. We can get to like seeing if some of these other, you know, how they get addressed. But did you have a question about like that one? I don't need that much. No, it's just through your list, as, right? no, I don't want to go through my list. It's just as you were talking about the RPCs helping the towns, I <clears throat> just going back to, you know, obviously my RPC is capable, um, but wow, if, if I was a town with an RPC that really just was not able to provide that, I think we're going to, I'll just be interested to figure out whether or not we've put enough funding in and whether or not there are other pieces we need to do as well. That's why we brought it in Yeah, and we need to get to it and yeah. talk about it. Representative Logan, do you yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Going. So I, sorry, so are you going to make, are you requesting inclusion of new language in J? Yes, I'd like to line up with these elements um, of the real with a. regional plan. Yeah. yeah. interesting about Jay, though, if I may, is that right now that language lines up with the language on critical resource areas in, on page 49. Yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. But we're changed, but not changing it. That's okay. We're, I mean, we're moving away from those being a jurisdictional trigger in their totality and trying to figure out which ones really should be. Right. So uh, there isn't any highlighting for quite a few pages, um, but the next, but section 35 does look at this new concept regarding uh, substantial regional impact. And so it might be a good idea since Charlie is here. <laughs> well, so, cause last week they asked me a lot of questions about substantial regional impact, how it's used right now, cause it is in the existing statute. Can, can you say a little bit about how it currently works? Uh, so it's a requirement statute right now, and 
it has some implication under criterion 10 or action 50, uh, particularly if there's a conflict between a municipal and regional plan. Uh, so that's uh, maybe, maybe the uh, NRB folks can better explain that part because we haven't really used it in my region in a long time ever. Uh, so that, that was there. And I think most, almost all the regions have a, uh, a list of project sizes. You know, maybe it's 100 long units and 200,000 square foot you know, factory, you know, but it's a long list of table. And they basically say anything that's this size with all these, in these use categories triggers a substantial regional impact. And so the RPC will is basically is saying uh, and letting everyone know we're going to engage more if you trigger that SRI definition. Um, and um, a lot of this, these sections here uh, kind of came from discussion, particularly with VTRANS, about in the absence of Act 250, how do RPCs engage on larger projects or VTRANS engage on larger projects? Um, I was like, my uh, peers are not. Uh, as concerned about this now because we're going to spend so much time with our towns getting here. Um, so this is does not feel like a need from the RPC side. Um, obviously, you have a choice about keeping it or not. And I, I think VTrans may have communicated with you. I wasn't part of that, but I think they they want to think about this some more um, in terms of uh, how they might engage in an alternative way. So anyway, there's a lot of language here. I'm not from my seat. I'm not sure it's needed anymore um, but that's uh to you to uh, discuss very yeah that's helpful charlie i heard from um i don't even know what to call them um whoever does our uh transportation our, our busing the federally state funded busing in our region about um, wanting to make sure that there was some box to check uh, during, well, this is about the plan. This is about the plan, right? This is, some of it is review. Yeah, yeah. this is about how these sections that follow here from 35 on are about uh, how RPCs and or VTRANS might engage in the municipal permit process. Okay. And so they're wanting, you know, like, hey, we would like to know if there's going to be a big, a big project built just to make sure that, you know, they've planned for us to drive our bus up there or something like that. Is this the appropriate section to think about that or not really? Maybe like, yeah, if you wanted to like kind of give them um, like, like the way RPCs have statutory party status in Act 250, like, I don't know, I guess maybe in theory you could give a transit agency party status in municipal permitting. I don't know about an expert on municipal permitting. Is, but theoretically, this these sections of statute might be where you would look at how to engage in municipal committee. Okay. Charlie, if I just can summarize what you said, you don't think this language is necessary anymore? You, um, a couple months ago, when we were talking about this, we were thinking but that it would be helpful. Um, and then it, on further reflection, we don't see the need for this any further, but uh, I'll speak train to us. But page 40 months, probably. All right. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Page nine to the top, page nine. Yeah. Uh, Smith is in here. Yeah, uh, uh, Savannah. Uh, the NRB. I had understood in a conversation earlier today that VTRANS was planning on submitting testimony or some information and that. I can't remember who told me, but said they had submitted information to, to the chair. It came through well. I don't know. I just, I'm second handing here right now, but you don't know who that would be from. I don't know. Amy Bell. Well, Amy Bell said it, but was it from her? Okay. What if that's from her, Michelle? 
Yeah. 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 We'll look for that. Or section 38. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think we apply to 35, 36, 37, 38. So if it's not here yet, it's forthcoming. Great, thanks. All right. And here we are at your section, Representative Evans. You're asking about complaints planning. We have walked through this language before. So, uh, hang on. Chris Cochran provided some written comments on this, right? This section, Jacob. Which, which section? Section 40, resilience planning. Uh, <clears throat> if I recall correctly, section 40, 41 are about just adding another use for exist the existing municipal planning grant program. And how um, subscribed is that every year? Is do, do people leave money on the table, or is it oversubscribed? Over uh, um, it was a less subscribed every year. Every year, by like how much do you keep track? Of? Uh, yeah, too. I could get that. I could get a report on that to the committee um, for the past say five years. If that's good for this all now. The municipal planning grants are used for things like a huge, a huge variety of projects from a uh, specific area of group planning. Let's say you want to do that on organization planning, technology planning, for a specific recreational space to comprehensive municipal plan, bylaw work, uh, natural resource planning, tremendous amounts of them. And we, and I think, what is the amount every year that we have for municipal planning grants? Um, it's gone up recently, so around five, five six, I think it's, uh, five, fifty or six fifty. Charlie, we were nodding, but I, uh, I, I, um, I think we were at six fifty last year. Six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. And then we are putting. This is this is this is a one-time appropriation in here. There is a one-time appropriation, yes. And so not doing anything to this kind of, and it's always is it always every year like. It is a portion of the property transfer tax. tax yeah. Oh. Yeah. Representative. Seventeen percent. To RPCs and. Yes. Grants. Yes. There are three things that are funded by 17% because some go to the GIS center, then there's the RPC allocation. There's the this poll. They, those three things, 17%, and the rest goes to the HCV? Well, it goes to a few different places, I think. 50% of the HCV and then, and then the, I think the other that goes to the general fund. Thank you for that clarification, Charlie. And clean water. Yeah. We did a clean water short time time constrained. Representative Logan. Yes. Um, I reviewed S311 and I noticed that there were there was a pretty extensive funding proposal in S311 that had to do with regional planning processes and things so, like that. Yeah. There's so it would be interesting to look at what they're thinking because eventually I feel like it's going to have that natural resources over in the Senate is going to have to deal with any differences we have in between our two where we're coming together. Is that the go back stuff? No, it's from it's the B home back development, the B home, the B home bill, but it has a lot of language on appropriations in there. They have a so they have a single appropriation. I uh, actually, I it changed it many times. But it, it's a surcharge on the property transfer tax of two and a half percent that raises, and the first two million would go to regional plan. Right. Oh, okay. Yes. I did not draft it, so that's why I can't remember specifics. Who did draft it? 
Kirby because it's a tax provision. Yeah, so that is what it calls for. Um, and that may get right, you know, that that's in their bill, I think. Yeah, and so finance yeah. is supposed to take up the money sections. Yeah. Um, but let's just hit the highlights and then Jacob, can you can you give us a high level of what I mean, I, I think Chris had some feedback on this section. Yeah, I think it, um the, the feedback that I've heard from Chris is that uh if it's to be funded that that it flow through the planning grant uh, process and not be stood up as a standalone uh, granting process, and that we could have guidelines that target funding to uh, resilience or flood planning or climate projects. But uh, what happened with the bylaw modernization grant is that we had to build an entire separate granting structure uh, for that smaller amount of money. Uh, so it creates a lot of just created a lot of administrative work, whereas we can use our existing systems and still uh, prioritize uh, funding uh, to specific projects without standing up the second grant. And just to follow up on uh, Representative Scalia, your question, we awarded six hundred and seventy-three thousand uh, dollars to um, uh, to fifty-seven applicants, and we had one point two seven two million in requests. <laughs> Last year. So this doesn't stand up a separate program, actually. It just changes. An earlier version of the language did. And that's, I think that's the message that Chris just wants to make sure to send. Can we get some, do you guys support this language? I mean, you can tell us tomorrow, but um, that's a question I have. Yeah, I don't believe this is going to be government's question. Um, but it's, from an administrative standpoint, uh, I'll, I'll, we can have a question. All right. Um, with that, we're able um, to take a break until tomorrow morning. Um, and we can be at nine, nine o'clock.